Let's lift our hands and give God all the praise. Tonight is an extraordinary night. Can you lift your hands, lift your voice? Bless him. Shibaka Parusata Pradavanadabaganabaganabanabosh. Jebratos Kabranda Vashkala Brahata Suda Branda Dada Brady. I will praise him from everlasting, everlasting to everlasting. I will praise him from everlasting, everlasting to everlasting. I will praise him from everlasting, everlasting to everlasting. I will praise him from everlasting. you to lift your voice and say this is my night of transformation go ahead and pray you will be so changed tonight there will be a moment of radical transformation Reta Subrandi Bara Shubra Kata Bari Anabala Nabash Ingretos Kalabrati Shabrani Dere Bara Anabala Nabakosia My life is changing, my life is changing Go ahead and pray Radical transformation By the power of the Holy Ghost Your light, your light is empowering me tonight Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. The Bible says they grow from strength to strength. As many that appear in Zion before God. Tonight is one of those nights that I believe your mind will be so changed your life will be so transformed i was so excited on my way coming because i knew for sure i'm telling you things will there is a veil that will be torn from your life Amen. i like you to pray and say lord grace to see not just grace to hear lift your voice and pray not just to get excited for nothing grace to see the kind of sight that will force results in my life. Those outside, make sure you are praying, make sure you are participating. Shabba <laughs> 
Zakata branda skaparata posoto preshke reba da baria da bala da ba. Randa kapa kata ba shabara da bala da ba karata sabra dege da bala da bo. Rekata prasha brando gosuba da bala da ba. Alleluia. Alleluia. I want to welcome everyone here tonight. It's always a joy to have us. There's a lot to do tonight, so we're not going to waste time. By the way, after this um, session, tonight is an impartation, so let your heart be open. Because for many of you, it will start. Impartation is simply a transference of grace. A transference of spiritual possibilities. Are we together now? It's not about falling down and standing up. It's about something tangible entering you. You heard the testimony of the gentleman who came here. Listen, let me tell you. When grace comes on you, you know you have gotten it. It's not about saying, I think I have it. If you are not sure, you don't have it. Tonight, don't just listen. I want you to receive. This is not one of those nights we come with our pride and arrogance, hoping to see if we can get one or two things everyone here take off your golden crowns and listen to the lord let him speak to us and have something to write please those outside and in all the overflows and then those following us online pay attention pay attention because your life will be blessed in the name of the lord jesus christ hallelujah so we're going to go straight to the interactive session it's going to be very interesting it's going to be um around four areas basically spiritual growth relationship and family life finances and leadership so our discussion is going to be around these four areas but um we will dwell very strongly on family life and finances we want to stay there relationship family life and then finances we want to stay a bit there because it concerns a lot of us um so please pay attention there are a few people that I'll be calling up stage. Uh, but then in the course of it, it's not just going to be us speaking. Praise the Lord. I hope that in the course of the discussion, we will also allow people to come and talk. Tonight, we want to see how God will grant us grace to do justice to these issues. Praise the Lord. So, there are three things I would require of us. Number one, please be disciplined and be well behaved. Especially where opportunity is given unto us to ask questions or even come out you have to be disciplined any act of indiscipline will just send you back so prepare your mind so that you save yourself any embarrassment praise the lord and then as much as possible we'll pay attention i believe that the people will be able to talk i'll be moderating i'll also participate and you're going to learn a lot Brothers, especially, I'm on your case tonight. Let your eyes, your ears, your spirit, everything that can be open, let it be open to listen and receive. Every armed robber came from a family. Every wicked father was a sincere man who did not understand good leadership. Are we together now? And so you're going to be listening. The Bible talked about a man who was once in the faith called Demas. And he, for some reason, he did not understand the principle of sustainable grace and he fell out of grace and so on and so forth and he was used as an instrument of caution so there is a lot that we're going to be dealing with so i'll call um a few people let's see if we need more chairs we'll have a jimmy please honor him appreciate him praise the lord hallelujah by the way the the surprising part of it is they do not even know they are the facilitators hallelujah it was intentional so that they will give you their best we don't want any plastic state, state managed response here we want it real time so i'm the only one who knows i'm going to be here none of them knows that we're going to be here please dr jelly can come please honor him hallelujah our daddy prof sir please hallelujah Praise the Lord. Appreciate them, honor them. Please sit down, make yourself very, very comfortable. You can leave the last row for me. Uh, the last, and I'll sit down there. Hallelujah. Where is Shade? Shade, his wife, let's have a representative of the ladies here. Hallelujah. Is she here? 
Okay, please. She can relieve her from the finance department and then let her come. Praise the Lord. Pastor Alpha. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Open your mouth in one minute and say, Lord, speak to me. Go ahead and pray. Speak to me, O oh God. Speak to me. By the power of the Holy Spirit. Speak to me. I open up my heart. I open up my spirit. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Now, I understand that um, the protocol department is making arrangement for questions you may have. We may not take all the questions and then the fact that we are sitting here doesn't mean we are the only ones who will be responding. I'm going to give opportunity for people. You can come up and respond. If your idea is not making sense, we'll receive it and send you back. So please make sure you know what you are saying. Don't just come out and disgrace yourself. We are very serious tonight in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's only that we need to have representatives here so that we can communicate these things. So uh, praise the Lord. All right, please sit down. You're welcome. Hallelujah. Good evening, sirs. They are all, um, they seem to be a bit nervous, but just one answer will quench everything. Trust me, these people are very brilliant, and there is a reason why they are all here. Praise the Lord. Shadi decided to run and sit near her husband so that whatever happens, um, amen. Now, we're going to be discussing along five areas or four areas, like I said. Number one is spiritual growth. Um, number two is relationship and family life. General relationships, but we're going to focus on um, family and love relationship. I believe in family. I believe that family represents the bedrock of society. Every citizen, every thief, every terrorist comes from a family. Praise the Lord. And then we're going to be talking around finances. By God's grace, as a person and as a ministry, we're unapologetic about the role that finances play. So um, please, we'll need, we'll help us. We need um, mics, at least one or two. Can you help us coordinate yourself so that we have that? We should have at least one or two. Praise the Lord. I'll discuss the subject at random because in the course of answering, some of them will step into other topics. So it's not just going to be um, streamlined. But then I would leave the spiritual area, spiritual growth as the last session. Because if we start with it, trust me, we won't talk about money again. We won't talk about family There'll probably be people under the anointing shouting, and that's how we end the service. So we we'll start, and then we can end so that we just flow into the session uh, of the impartation. You can give them the mics. You don't have to. Yes. Thank you. Hallelujah. Amen. Shade, what is wrong with women today? What exactly is the problem? What, what is wrong with women? You're speaking on behalf of very concerned brothers. What exactly is the problem? Have they changed? Have they evolved? Is it that we don't understand them? Are they so difficult? Is that the way it's supposed to be? What exactly is wrong with women? Please go ahead. With respect to relationships, really, personalities, relationships... Is that working? Praise the Lord. Um, Daddy, what is wrong with women? I, okay. Um. Feel free. Don't try to be right. Trust me. I'm here for you. I'm a facilitator. That's why, that's why I decided to coordinate it myself. I'm, I'm both a speaker and a coordinator. So 
I can. Okay. Um, in terms of relationship, let me assume maybe um, why we. Can you hear her? Okay. Please, sorry. technical, you will have to help us. We need volumes. Praise on the, right the Lord. All right. In terms of relationships and um, maybe some of our behaviors before marriage, before saying yes and all of that, I think I would like to summarize it in a word or two. Maybe fear or insecurity, something like that. I don't know. Fear of the unknown. And that's why she may have to size a young man again and again before saying yes. And um, even if he's present, she, she, she may have to look and wonder if his present has a little bit of what she has always desired. Remember, ladies, we always have our list intact, right? Yes, I had it too. So I know we always have it. So something like that. Amen. Amen. Very interesting. Um, you're still there. Hold on. If I say I love you, what does that exactly mean to you? When a brother tells a sister, I love you. I think there's confusion somewhere. We need to define terminologies very clearly. Um, if I meet a lady and I say, I love you. What is our interpretation of what I have said? In your opinion, speak on behalf of the ladies. Because I think the brothers are really confused somewhere. We need to clarify. Go ahead, please. I admire you. Maybe something like that. Okay. I admire you. I want to have a relationship with you. You fascinate me. Yeah. You trip me. You okay. psych. Something like that. I don't Amazing. Know. It's going to get interesting here. I don't know what jumped me into family life straight up, but I'm, I'm happy. The first concept that we're going to deal with here that I believe, listen carefully, has been a big problem in relationship and family is understanding the perspective of a woman and the perspective of a man are we together now according to scripture a man's design is such that he is goal oriented and purpose driven are we together so everything that has to do with love for a man is with respect to his purpose and destiny everything on the journey is only a means to an end are we together now so when a man tells a lady i love you speaking from the standpoint of a man this is what he's trying to say i know where i'm going i'm absolutely sure and i believe you are able to help me get there are we together now so he speaks to her telling her i love you with respect to purpose but sadly i have come to understand i have had the privilege of counseling people that that has nothing to do with love for a lady so, Ejimi, when you told Hope you loved her, what exactly was her understanding? Go ahead. <laughs> Praise God. Well, for me, um, when I told Hope I loved her, and I still love her a lot, I love her more every day as the day goes by, um, what I meant was, in all honesty, I see a picture of your future that my presence in your life can help you achieve it, it had nothing to do with emotions it had nothing to do with fascination it had everything to do with you are this wonderful person my presence in your life can help you become an even better person and your presence in my life can help me become an even better person the feelings the euphoria it's an additional package but so why good. did you marry her because you didn't have to marry her for all this to happen i mean you could easily just have it a disciple oh, come on i think see i'm your friend tonight and um amen because listen this is very serious and i think brothers we need to listen because while a man's perspective of love has to do with purpose and whatever helps him get there if i am busy trying to prepare a sermon are we together now i am on my assignment and if a lady brings me a cup of water to help me become energetic and be able to think or a plate of food i interpret what she has done as love because i see how it supports what i'm doing if she comes and tells me she wants attention i know it's right but i interpret that as a distraction 
because I believe I am busy doing something. Are we together? Now, but it's interesting to know that love has nothing to do with purpose for a lady. Nothing to do with assignment. Are we together? So, when, when a guy tells a lady, for instance, I love you, this is what she means. I am busy and I'm purpose driven. I know that. But I have seen that I am able to give you time, give you attention. Are we together now? And give you the emotional confidence you need to become the person God has destined for you to be. I am aware of the cost implication of loving you and I'm still making that choice. This is what ladies interpret by I love you. So the man says, I love you. And this is what he's saying. Walk with me through life and destiny. And the lady says, I love you too. And he says, give me time and attention and then I'll pay attention to you. They think they have communicated well. And then the relationship starts or the marriage starts and the lady is saying, you are so selfish. And the man comes back by 10 o'clock and says, I was sweating day and night to make sure we pay this rent so you are comfortable. And then the lady says, let the rent go places. You are thinking about your destiny and forgetting about me. Hey, Jimmy, what do you have to say about this? Because this has broken a lot of marriages. We are coming, I'm telling you, we are going to exhaust the grace upon everybody so the plane is just lifting. Praise God. Personally, for me, this is what I always think about. Because I know that for a lady, time, attention, intimacy are very important. Um, when I started dating my wife now, I made sure I understood what was important to her. And I evaluated whether I will be willing and able to sacrifice my own desires for a little while to help her establish her own so that in response she will now say okay let's do your own so when i evaluated it i said this lady's goals and dreams i can pause mine for a little while to help her establish hers and i think i may be wrong but i think that has really helped in um, in in getting us where we are that is uh, I mean it's very interesting to sit close to your son-in-law and um, be discussing on this subject what would you say is the one problem of the younger generation as compared to the perspective of the people within your age range what what is different about your priorities for marriage and relationship as against what we prioritize now yes sir seriously i'm going to say this in a sentence i'll say that this generation depend more on their eyes wow than their spirit man now that's a father speaking so you pay attention this generation depends more on their eyes than their spirit man which is dangerous the bible warns us with multiple scriptures to be careful because the eyes can deceive and um, go ahead sir you know like if you see this generation when i was growing up i think i said it to some uh, people maybe some month back you see the houses we saw in the villages those days as mansion if i go there now i just feel as if they were built for guinea pigs <laughs> so so you see like in your own generation i think we were growing up and you see so many things that are fanciful you see like when we were growing up everybody was wretched around you so you didn't see a distinction between a rich man and a poor uh, person so, so you see when it comes to a matter of choice of a wife we depended so much on our heart what our heart was saying and not what the eye sees but you see in this generation because you see different type of people different type of these things. We don't allow our heart to speak. We are controlled by what we see. There's every tendency, your mind will be talking to you about someone. But you tend to see the future of the person you see with what is associated with him at that particular uh, time. And I want to just say this, that many of the ladies I see today, that if I was young, and you were my wife, you might not have married me. You see, at the time I approached my wife, at that time, I was a teacher. Sir. That's right. And you see, there was somebody who proposed to her 
that was already a major general in the army. Uh, now, like pay attention. Said, Hold on, sir. <laughs> Let's not let this just pass like that. We need to, we need to press it in because um, there's a time to laugh and there's a time to be serious. I think this is one of those times. Mm -hmm. Let's pay attention and understand something very interesting that we can glean from the wisdom of well over 30-something years of marriage. Because there's something our daddy is saying that if we do not pay attention to, we might miss out on it. Are we together? Now, that is telling us that at the time when he was proposing to his wife, he was a teacher. But there was someone else who had proposed to her. Am I right, sir? Yes. Who was a major general in the army. Go ahead, sir. Praise the Lord. You, you see, like, uh, I will tell you that even myself, I was afraid. <laughs> but all along, she kept reassuring me that it was not riches was interested in but what the Lord was telling her and her heart towards me. And we later on got married. You see, I think that has controlled my heart all through our 30 years of relationship. You see, whatever I want to do to her, I will always think back. That you see, she, if it is whatever I am today, she so thinks better than that and she sacrificed for me. And that's why I vowed to that I'm going to make every sacrifice to see that she's comfortable. To get to your... Wow. You know, I have a very creative mind. My mind works like a calculator. You cannot imagine how many questions are already roaming around my mind seeking um, for expression. But I want to try to narrow this down because we're going to first talk about relationships then we will go into the home and then i want us to talk a bit about in-laws and the influence of third party parents relations on marriage and so on and so forth i think if we touch these areas we can move on um we can move on to other areas dr jelaesa what should a godly young man who is serious with God be looking out for in a lady guide me sir I'm a young man let me stand up I'm a young man who has been to koinonia I love God I have listened to the messages and now I am considering settling down and I come to you as a mentor and as a coach can you please lead me from step A to B to C what should I look out for should I dream? Should I hear God? Should I just walk to the lady? I mean, can you give us from step A to B? Because I think that a lot of people are confused in our generation right now as to um, what are the parameters. There are all kinds of books. There are all kinds of conferences. And what someone is saying is what another person is refusing. And they are all enjoying their marriage, supposedly. So, the average young person is really confused, especially the man. So help us, sir. What Hallelujah. should we look out for? Hallelujah. I, I think you are going to excuse me. I'm a very shy person. So just excuse me with that. Okay? I haven't said that. I will just, to answer your question, sir. Any young man that is looking out to, you know, marry a lady or whatever is looking out, you know, in a lady, I think the first and foremost thing should be the fear of God. Can he sincerely say that this person fears God? Okay, just hold on, sir. I'll, I'll let you continue. The fear of God means what exactly? Going to church? Praying in tongues? Uh, um, well, those things are part of what yes. fear of God is. But it's not actually the root thing about the fear absolutely, of God. Absolutely. The root thing about the fear of God is that the person must be born again and seeks to know God continually. Then uh, such a person trembles at the word of God. Okay, sorry, sir. I, I'm sorry I have to cut you. You will continue. Is it a negotiable condition? Uh, to me, it is not. It is not. Because I, I think that is the core. That's the core of entering into a relationship with someone. Because that, that is what you are going to bank on. Uh, 
you know, in, into the relationship, things will happen. And if someone does not have the fear of God, is the likelihood is that the person may take some decisions that that is not uh, um, that may be harmful. Right. That may be harmful. Right. So it, it, it's not negotiable. It has to be the fear of God, as in sincerely the fear of God, not that probably you are not sure or you know the person has to have the fear. Of God. The second part of the question, sir, is. Are you speaking about the requirements in order of priority? Is it in order of priority or should the fear of God be considered last? I'll give you an instance. Assuming there are three points we are talking about. The fear of God, maybe a wealthy person, and maybe a handsome guy. Are we talking about a guy or a lady now? Lady. Yes, a, a guy is looking at a lady. So, is it beauty first? I mean, this is wonderful, drop-dead beautiful lady. Then... Haven't ascertained that she's beautiful, I now say, Does she fear God? Or do I just close my eyes and say, Before I open it, do you fear God first? I mean, is it in order of priority? Yeah, yeah the, the order is first thing first, the fear of God. Now, the beauty thing and all of that is just they come as icing on wow. the cake, so it's not really. I, I was going, even going to say this the other time that to me, love is a choice. It's not really about feelings, you know. If the feelings come, yes, praise God for feelings, uh, feelings and all of that. But it is actually a choice that you choose to love this person, whatever you know comes and all of that. So the fear of God will, will, is what will keep that choice for one. The fear of God will keep that choice for one. If the person eventually, God forbid, shows something funny, now uh, it's. Uh, it's there's hardly how you can because we are spiritual beings we are children of god if this person is not well rooted in god there's hardly how you can fellowship i mean how you can bond that's how it is you can hardly bond with a person so the the the, the other like you asked sir, is that this person must have the fear of god first and foremost the beauty icing on the cake thank you so your major priority is that when a brother is setting out to really build a marital destiny beyond and above every other thing there should be the fear of god let me buttress a bit on that point and then we'll go to pastor alpha um this is a very powerful point mind you um i think aside from me all these people are married and so they are speaking pragmatically i'm speaking by the anointing <laughs> are we together so these people are speaking both by the anointing and i've had the privilege of fellowshipping with their families quite intimately and i can tell you they are they are living heaven on earth literally are we together now so this is very important and dr jelaya is telling us here that the fear of god brothers you must pay attention when you are about to build a life our daddy prof said something that i think is very instructive that they worked with their spirit, they worked with their heart, but our generation is so sensual, we are so carnal, the scope of everything we look at relationally is just sensual. So you see a lady looking fine and all of that, and at once, you don't care what God has to say, you don't care whether, you know, the lady is virtuous and loves God, and um, that's why I had to correct it, because the fear of God, brothers and sisters, is called reverence for god not just faith in god brothers it matters that this lady fears god to fear god means to submit to his governing authority to take his word as the final authority over your life are we together now so the fact that the lady prays in tongues or comes to church is no guarantee whatsoever what is her willingness her malleability as far as the word of God and the principles of the kingdom are concerned. This is very, very interesting. I truly, truly agree with Dr. Jelaya because many people keep making this blunder. They just walk with beauty and, and there's a place for beauty, but it's amazing uh, that many guys will be willing to wreck their destiny. I personally consider it to be so self-centered when a man does not think of his children and all he's thinking about is, I want to satisfy 
my emotional curiosity by marrying a pretty lady not knowing what role she's going to play in destroying the destiny of the children to come are we together now a man is married and nine months later a child comes and for the rest of that marriage at least 25 to 30 years depending on how many children they have to factor in children in the equation so i do not see a reason why a man can be so sensual and so carnal and the entire scope of your desire for a wife someone who will work with you not a degree that you just do for five years and throw away the certificate so that that i think brothers i want to challenge you on this excessive carnality this drive a lady is nice she's this she's figure eight and that's the entire condition that makes someone want to stake his entire destiny the generation looking upon him just i think that's really really selfish praise the lord is god helping us are we getting something here ladies what does that tell you it tells you shade is going to speak a little uh later to ladies but i think that in my opinion and i may be wrong but i think that if there is one issue i have seen with the ladies in our generation is that our emphasis on the physical far outweighs our interest to deposit something sincere in our spirits there is so much craze about the physical how i look a lady can punish herself for one year trying to slim down and look fair and look dark and you know all of this and not mind whether she's growing spiritually we have a generation that is so sensual even those who think they love god love god only when they think they are okay with the physical there seems to be this embarrassment when a lady thinks she's spiritual at the expense of her beauty now that's not to say she should neglect that but believe me brothers and sisters the physical does not compare by any means to the quality of a virtuous woman are we together now is god helping us pastor alpha please talk to the brothers how do i know i'm ready for marriage what should be in place praise god <laughs> okay um one of my mentors will call marriage marry age and then he said the age differs from one person to the other i think knowing i'm ready for marriage is highly dependent on your understanding of what marriage is in the first place because if you don't know what marriage is you will not know when you are ready for marriage i i grew up being concerned about the statement go for weddings you always hear it they say it again and again they tell you that marriage is a school that you get the certificate before you start and um, the reason they give the certificate before you start is because you are not going to graduate for it. And I was concerned until God started teaching me. And, and I came to a point that my conclusion is that marriage is not a school. It's a workplace. Because, um, thank God we have a lot of medical doctors here. You go to a medical school to study medicine. And when you have studied all the anatomies and the physiologies and the, everything that they study, a point comes and you are satisfied to have learned everything that is required to practice medicine. Then you graduate and then you take an oath and then you start practicing medicine. So I believe that I am supposed to go through a school of marriage and my graduation is supposed to be the wedding day where I am issued a certificate that I've learned all that I need to learn to practice now, when I get MBBS as a medical student, if I, my going to school after that is by choice. It does not reduce me from being a medical doctor. I can decide to go for my residency, is that what they call it? Or go and become a consultant. That's by choice. I'm already a doctor. So, there are basic lessons I'm supposed to learn. Number one, know what marriage is from the perspective of the kingdom. And what marriage is supposed to serve and the tools required to make that marriage work so i need to have that physical maturity and then that maturity in 
terms of purpose in line with what God sent me to the earth to do and every other resource that is needed to make that assignment work including financial stability emotional stability spiritual stability all of this I would have gotten going through the school of marriage that they are certifying so that day that I'm taking the oath of marriage I'm already ready to practice marriage in the workplace so I think understanding marriage is something that goes a long way to tell me when I should be ready for marriage. Well, that's very interesting. I think this is a very powerful point because um, it, gets, it gets deeper now and I want us to pay attention. The average gentleman uses age or graduation or post-service life to be the signal that the next thing in the calendar is marriage. So, after service, maybe you get a job with a bank or a teacher and then there's pressure coming from your mom, your dad, I want to see my grandchildren and it looks like logically the next thing is to settle down. And um, he's saying something that is very powerful here. That nobody is authorized by God's perspective to stand on that altar and exchange vow with any lady who does not understand what marriage is all about. Is that true? When you are about to take people to start working, they have not started working, yet you tell them you must bring certain qualifications. Is that true? And then you pass, do, through, you pass them through an interview, a test, an aptitude test. You shortlist them to be employed, not to become managers. Are we together now? But when it comes to the issue of marriage, there are so many people when they stand on that altar and they say, right now, we're standing before this and that, they do not even know what the man of God is saying. They are just excited. They can't wait for the marriage to finish. They cut the cake and disappear. So I think that one of the reasons why many marriages end up as a disaster is that the man does not even have any idea on what God's perspective is in marriage. He does not know his roles. Are we together now? And that leads me to the next question. Ejimi, articulate what the role of a man is in the home. What exactly is the job description of a man? For me, um, the man is number one, the first and foremost, he is the recipient of God's blueprint for that family. Wow. That means that when God has an assignment, a task, that he wants to achieve on the face of the earth. His default initial choice is a family. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. As such, the man must be in a position to hear God to a degree. When I say hear, I don't mean the audible voice of God. He should look back over his life and be able to pinpoint crossroads where it was divine direction that got him to where he is. So if someone says, why are you doing the job you are doing? Or why are you in the profession you are doing? Or why did you come to ABU? Or after graduation, you were serving. They said you can work in the bank or you can... Why? He should be able to say that God is the reason for my decisions so far. Very important. Then when God sees that this man has been faithful, one will chase a thousand, two will put ten thousand to flight. God will now say, let me add someone to you that exponentially multiplies your outcome then he brings a similar woman who will not frustrate what god has already started in the life of that man that means the man should understand his assignment to a degree and know the kind of person that cannot fit into his assignment not whether born again or not the bible says can two work together except they be agreed a man that has reached a level of spiritual maturity Maybe God can ask him to sow everything. And then God is telling him to marry a woman who doesn't even believe in Titan, even though she's born again. I'll ask that man to wait until that woman comes into that level of revelation. If not, he will sow and they will box themselves. He will go and collect back that seed <laughs> that he sowed. So there must be some level of patterns of spiritual direction because the man is the recipient of spiritual instruction we see that from the garden of eden having said that the second thing i believe that should be in the life of that man 
is a notable demonstration of responsibility not a theoretical demonstration of responsibility not that he can preach about responsibility as a woman you are coming under a man's covering you have to ask yourself who else has this man covered god speaking to adam he brought some animals that adam should name so adam was responsible for a number of animals so adam had a track record of responsibility maybe not to the level of a woman but somebody should be able to point at you and say this person's presence in my life has contributed to my progress so far if a woman cannot identify a man who has contributed somewhat to the progress of others that means she is the first and we all know what happens when you do something for the first time failure is guaranteed then you learn and do again so has he been responsible towards his mother has been responsible towards his father what is what are his pastors his church members the people around him saying has he been responsible towards his siblings that means he can very easily accept your own responsibility so a demonstrable proof of responsibility the third is a man who is mature in terms of dealing with ladies there is a fundamental difference between the way a man reasons and a lady reasons i don't think it is advisable for a man's first encounter with the uniqueness in ladies um, um perceptions that means he should have been a leader and he should have led certain ladies i'm not talking about sex i'm not talking about sexual experiments uh -uh. i mean a man who has had a track record of seeing ladies and adding to them not taking from them when i see a lady going to meet a guy who is interested in sleeping with her and then he says i will marry you i will marry you whether you sleep with him or not the mere fact that the motivation is to sleep with you you are in for a shock after you marry and that man sleeps with you and you are his wife that's the end so i feel he should have a track record of understanding how women behave having said that based on the strength of those three things a man can say he's ready to take on a wife number one a, a history of divine direction number two a clear demonstration of responsibility number three a minimum level of familiarity with the differences between a man and a woman in terms of their mindset at that point you can go ahead amazing amazing i think this is this is really remarkable i'm, I'm trusting that god is really helping us to learn a few things um let me just buttress on his points you see he made it's very amazing how people who never work with God claim to hear God when it comes to marriage. They have no other notable track record of working with God in any other area. They are lazy, they don't pray. All of a sudden, they come with boldness. And then they don't even seek advice. They believe that for the first time in your life, the first revelation, the first experiment of revelation is over a lady. And you come and intimidate the lady and say, I saw you, I know what I saw. Are we seeing that now? So, Ejimi is saying you must have a track record because the way you saw the lady is the way you have to see other things in that family as you walk. So, if you guessed your way into her life, when challenges go bad, you will have to sit down and wonder if you made the right decision. You will need that divine direction. Number two is responsibility. Listen, if we stop here and deal with this issue of responsibility, many brothers are irresponsible we're going to talk about that masculinity is not equal to responsibility that you are macho and you wear nice jeans and you have beard on your face it does not mean that you are responsible so many brothers keep fooling themselves and believing that they are fit because i'm 30 i'm 25 i'm 35 and i can come to church especially spiritual brothers spirituality does not automatically make a man responsible responsibility is an intentional decision responsibility is an awareness of the cost dimension of life so you begin to look at life from a cost dimension not that it should happen but you make it happen are we together now so we now say buy swan water for everybody all our our facilitators should have swan water a responsible man says who pays for it how does the money come not yes we should buy it that's how people speak that's how a wife should speak 
honey i think we we need water for all these people then a responsible man says all right so let's look at it is there a budget for it how do we work when the man also says yes i think it's a good idea he's an irresponsible man you don't just agree we should take our children to this school beautiful idea i mean that's nice no who pays for it many brothers do not think from a cost dimension it's shameful when you see many brothers moving and maybe a lady wants to buy something and the brother does not even think ah, who is going to pay for it she says can you pick something i say ah why not and then he's just speaking it's already a seed of irresponsibility in motion are we together let me tell you how you know you are not responsible when you have an unquenchable appetite for free things you are very irresponsible an unquenchable appetite for free things you are not ashamed even if they keep doing free things for you every day are we together a woman calls you and says come and be eating in my place and you do that for one week and instead of you to say the next time i'm coming i think i should hold a tuba of yam he said mama i'm here again you are very irresponsible because that's exactly what will happen you will get married to your wife are we together now and then you sit down and say where is my food why is there one piece of meat here you are not working you are not doing anything you don't know how it came many of us here sincerely speaking our parents were like that they still are like that and the purpose of this is to begin to reorient our minds are we together now shall they please talk to ladies what is the one secret that has kept your husband so in love with you i know how much doctor loves you so much i mean um oh yes oh yes oh yes So what is the one secret, really? I mean, what would you advise a lady? What is the key to making a man really love you? Not lost. What is the one key? We are busy. We are visionary. So what secret is enough to distract us away from that purpose to focus on you and become so addicted to you and grow old with you? What would be the key? Talk to ladies hallelujah well um i think sir if i'm going to say what is the secret it may be directed to him because i don't know what he sees that keeps him so in love amen but then i i think i'll just say a little of what god helps me understand day by day um i think a man i think i believe a man appreciates a woman that will stand by him a woman that believes in him praise the lord it's wonderful to marry a millionaire it's wonderful to marry a man that is working in an oil company and all of that but what if he's not there yet do you still see him as the man a man is a man no matter the level he is a man wants to always be a man brothers i believe i'm saying the truth absolutely so it doesn't mean it, it doesn't matter how much you're earning a man must be a man praise the lord so as a woman you must learn to respect him no matter the level he is and then i also believe that a man okay like i said a woman that can stand by him a woman that is willing to support him and these things begin even from relationship days it's not just in marriage it starts from relationship there's an adage that says what an old man will be we can see right from when he's a child from 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 the relationship time we can know do you hold him do you hold his hands and say sweetheart i believe in you and i believe we can make this work together no matter what it looks like when right there now. is nothing yet yes yes it's very very important our ladies of today please i really want to talk to us gifts are wonderful the valentine cakes are wonderful the perfumes are wonderful but please just in case they are not coming it doesn't mean he doesn't love you amen his please heart repeat his that heart part. may be with you R repeat repeat that part I i'm very very serious and i'm not apologizing for i'm not it. excusing brothers that are stingy please get me right uh, sorry <laughs> okay that was a quick Sorry. balance <laughs> it's very very important i say that i'm not excusing stinginess now brothers 
But then, before he begins to send 50K into your account every month or recharge your phone with 5,000 naira recharge every week, please, it's important to love him, first of all, for who he is and not what he has. A man will grow. Daddy once gave a teaching while we were in school. I don't know if Sir Pastor Ejimi should remember, Aaron would remember. There are things that we will still work in, you know. We don't have all we are supposed to have now. But then a man that has a focus, a man that has a vision, you should be able to identify a man that has a purpose, a vision, than just a man. I, I, I think Pastor, Pastor Funke used to say that marry a man with a vision and not just a man with a television. Because a man that has a vision will eventually put you on the television and you'll be broadcasted around the world. I don't know if you understand. It's important you marry him for his vision. Of course, like I've said, I've not excused our brothers. It's important you demonstrate your love. And then, ladies, um, my husband said something about the fear of God. It's the fear of God that will keep you to be a prayerful woman. You know, when we get married, we'll get to understand that marriage, as beautiful and as sweet and as appetizing as it looks, is also a place of hard work. Praise the Lord. I want to repeat that again. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a place of hard work. Yes. There are times you have to apologize even when you're not wrong. So our ladies that are arrogant, our ladies that are proud, that don't know how to say sorry, it's better you start rehearsing how to say sorry to your roommates even when you do not make a mistake. Because it's not all the time you may get the sorries when you need it. And when you don't, need, and when you don't get it, you still have to be the good wife. You still have to make the good and the wonderful delicacies and serve it because a man does not joke with his stomach. Amen. Amen. He doesn't joke with his stomach. No matter. My daddy have a welfare. We know now. Praise the Lord. A man does not joke with his stomach. As, as powerfully anointed as he is, he, 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 he appreciates good food. Praise the Lord. And I think I also want to talk about this, a lady, a, a little. Our ladies, it's good to go to um, um, Pepsi Garden. It's good. Indomie. I think Indomie is one of the worst things that has happened to us ladies these days. Because Indomie is such a fast food and then we forget our, our skills, our recipes and how to cook. It's important. There are actually ladies that don't know how to cook. And then we just sit down and relax and think. You get a cook, you get a person that washes the clothes, you get a person that sweeps the house, you get a person that bathes your children and does everything. And then you will also get a lady that will help you to husband or wife your husband as well. Amen. It's very, very important. The Bible talks about a wise woman as a woman that builds her house. And that's what brings us to the point again that marriage is hard work. A woman must be willing to build. Building, if you ask laborers that build houses, Building is not an easy thing to do. It's work. So you must take up the job of a laborer and build. And you build so that you can rest with time. Praise the Lord. Especially at the foundation level. The years of relationship, the first few years of marriage, and as we grow. Um, sorry, I hope I'm not exhausting my time. Go ahead. All right. Um, and that's it. And um, our ladies, we, we spoke about our good looks it's very important that we also look um, good. There was a time I was, I, I was about to go out and I put on an attire and my husband looked at me and said, you and this your clue, you have come again. I now said, what now? He now said, no, no problem, it's okay. I said, what? I followed him because sometimes he may not always just say it out so easily. He said, he now said I was looking haggard and I promised myself I would not wear that clothes again. And after I dressed the second time, I, am I okay now? Fine. You should look good for your husband. Praise the Lord. Ladies, it's important. Look good that he can hold your hands and freely introduce you to his friends, freely introduce you to his business partners, to his colleagues. Not like one message used to say, you just got dust one booba. I don't know if daddy remembers that message he once preached when we were in school. It's very important we look good and we keep ourselves clean. The house should be clean. Women of God, children of God, the house should be clean as much as possible. Thank God for air freshness and all of that. And uh, the house should be clean. Praise the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. Amazing. Um, 
I'm keeping our daddy silent because we'll soon hand the mic to him and he's going to speak extensively about the issue of in-laws. And uh, no one here is really qualified yet to speak so much about in-laws. We'll speak, but, but he really is going to address that. But I want to just air a concern and then I'll let us speak at random before we get to him. I think this concerns us what I'm about to, <clears throat> to point out. Two things have personally given me serious concern when it has to do with reconciling the reasons why marriages work and why they do not work. I think I have seen an error in men and an error in women. And you just permit me start and then you pick it up from there. The error I have seen is a transgenerational error and I think God is trusting our generation to correct it. The generation of our fathers, people um, with due respect of our daddy's age, you know, and maybe 10, 20 years after, that generation had a mindset. Please, everybody listen. Are we together? They had a mindset, largely uh, because many of them came from the village into the cities. They largely sponsored themselves through schools. Are we together now? At that time, it was not a fashionable thing for women to be educated. <laughs> the scope of womanhood was centered around making the home, raising children and taking care of them and taking care of her man. Am I, am I correct? Are we together now? So, it was a privilege. Now listen, please. It was a privilege for a man to now go to school, get his degree, and then come to the village and see the lady, one of the many women who go to the streams, and now say, I like this lady. She didn't have to bother. It was a privilege that a man was coming to the city to carry her. Are we, are we, are we together now? The definition of masculinity and being a woman was very clear. At that time, if they said you were a man, they meant you were a protector and a provider. You were a farmer or you had, there were obvious things the man could do that the woman could not do. So the difference was very clear. There was no basis for fighting. Are we together now? The lady knew that she was not educated and she would not even get a job. So she had no basis to accuse the man. You know? Um, again, the ladies were not embarrassed. Listen. It was never a thing of shame for the ladies to soil their hands to keep their home. Are we together? You would see how the woman would unashamedly fight to keep her husband. It was a commitment. That language has been translated among ladies in our generation now to mean desperation, which they hate so much. Ladies hate committing themselves in a relationship committing themselves in a marriage to make it work they interpret that commitment as desperation to mean look i have options i'm too beautiful for this mess are we together our mothers put their hands on the plow and they gave their best to their marriages there were many reasons why they would leave there were many reasons why things did not work but they were committed but right now, the average lady just tries it and once her definition of marriage and pleasure is not met, automatically she begins to intimidate the man. Now, having said that, that one problem of ladies has been their commitment. The commitment of an average lady to a relationship is very low. Are we together now? Where the commitment steps up is when he puts a ring. And then she says, wow, that means I should be serious with this guy. And the guy for three years has believed that this was his wife. But in her mind, she had been working with the possibility of leaving him one day. It was the ring that now solidified her commitment. Are we together now? But on the other side, something has happened to the men. Many men are insecure today. They abuse their wives and children. Because in the 21st century, there is hardly a correct definition of manhood and masculinity. When a man said he was a man, he meant I could provide, I could protect. But right now, everything the man can do, the woman can do too. Is that true? The man has a house, she has a house. He earns 500,000, she earns 1 million. Are we together? The car he's driving is her car. He's staying in a university quarter simply because the woman is working there. And so, 
his masculinity is being threatened by her achievement are we together now so he starts saying things like i hope you know i'm older than you don't joke with me i am the man here many men are insecure that's why they threaten their wives they stop them from working they stop them from having money are we together now and this error came from i'm sorry to say it mothers here i apologize but many of our mothers as a revenge mission to the way they were treated by our fathers they started counseling the ladies make sure you get your masters before you get married so that no man will treat you like a piece of rag and while that is supposed to be a good advice it has created a sense of independence in the ladies so they are embarrassed to look like if i lose this man i may not die but a major part of me would have been lost are we together now that that shame to identify with the man and their marriage so the woman is simply marrying the man to exit out of singleness she does not plan to submit because she thinks she must end her submission so if the car is her own if the house is her own if the salary comes from her she feels i should not submit to you and this is something that must be corrected i'm laying that platform because I, I want us to buttress on it this issue of submission why are ladies embarrassed to truly submit to a man what is the fear especially successful ladies especially ambitious ladies i have counseled hundreds of people and usually when the couples come they sit before me and you see the woman sitting down with arrogance the car was my own and when i'm talking she's just nodding and the man is helpless like a sissy like a child he doesn't even want to speak because he knows it can cost him he's staying in the house why are women so insecure about submission please talk anybody really we'll, we'll allow our dad rest because we're going to really disturb him a little pastor alpha anybody Thanks. go Please ahead go. Oh, please talk. Go ahead. Ladies first. Praise God. I think, um, Daddy, you answered it a bit when you first started. You said, unfortunately, by the reason of the way some of the mothers have been treated, and so the ladies now make up their minds that they won't be treated the same way. But I think one thing I would have to tell our ladies today, please, I stand to be corrected. It's better and it's safer for you to have the understanding that whatever you have, whatever it is you have belongs to your husband praise the lord i am i know i'm stepping on your toes everything you have your car yourself everything about you belongs to him and it's better he releases he allows you now take charge of whatever it is that he wants you to take charge of it's very important remember the 24 elders the bible says something they cast it down their golden crowns for the lamb it's important no matter your achievement you could be the dg of navdak you could be the executive director of napri whatever you are once you get into your home you are the wife and you should submit the bible says in all things it's not easy i tell you especially if it's a man that now sometimes bosses over you unusually praise the lord and doesn't even want any form of glory to come to you it's not easy it can be painful but remember jesus he did not count it robbery to be equal with god it's the same relationship we must have with our husbands whatever it is you have belongs to your husband we men of god wow. amazing amazing go ahead hallelujah go ahead. praise god and whatever he has sorry my husband just added this whatever he has belongs to you i think we feel more consoled about that amen praise god hallelujah you know when i spoke the first time i used the analogy of somebody going through school i emphasized preparation before marriage and then i mentioned understanding the purpose of marriage that mentioned so many things, changes that have happened over time. And the world will tell you that the only thing that is constant is change. But I don't agree with that. The only thing that is constant is the word of God. And civilizations have changed, but the word of God has remained. The same word of God in the days of our father is the same word of God 
they have not called for a review of the Bible. It is the same. So that means even if the parameters of measuring masculinity, being a man and all that, seem to have changed over time. If the word of God has not changed, then the word of God should be the final authority. And if we must understand marriage, sorry to say this, I, I prepared for marriage like somebody studying for a degree. I tried to, I studied a lot of homes. I tried to, in a bit to understand women, I tried to find out, okay, I meet a woman that is recalcitrant, stubborn, and I discovered that they are not fighting in their home. The husband is a good man, he's happy, he's productive. So I get close to the man to find out, how is he handling this thing? Because I know the woman, some of them are my relatives. I know that this woman is stubborn. How is the husband handling? So I get close, maybe serve, and sometimes I'm studying, I'm noticing a lot of things. What is this person doing? But after all those studies, I came to a conclusion. My mentor as a husband is Jesus Christ. And my mentor as to what a wife is expected to do is the church of Jesus Christ. So I look at what is the role of Jesus to his church. Whatever Jesus did is what is expected of me to do as a husband. What does Jesus expect from his bride, the church? Whatever Jesus expects from the bride is what is expected of me. And then to buttress this, I studied Proverbs chapter 31. The description of that man looked like a very responsible person because nothing was said about what that man was doing. The first time he was mentioned, the Bible says he trusted in his wife. And because of that, he will not see evil all the days of his life. The next thing they said is always sitting at the gate and he is honored in that place. Every act of industry mentioned in Proverbs 31 were attributed to the woman. She was the one that sees the land and buys it. She was the one that uh, goes and buys clothes for her house. She was the one that her candle is always up. She was the one that was doing many things. The only thing we heard about the husband is a Kai, many women have done well, but you are better than all of them. And the Bible still says that he's honored at the gate. And I kept wondering, and I see that man as Jesus Christ. Jesus is no longer on earth. He finished his assignment. He has gone to sit on the throne at the right hand of his father. And he's sitting there. We didn't hear that he came back to come and look for money to give to church to do crusade. So everything that is happening upon the earth right now, he sent the Holy Spirit to come and help the church. But it's the church that is responsible for bringing all the results, not some. It's the church that should win soul. It's the church that should have dominion upon the earth. It's the church that is doing everything. But after the church has earned every of those things, the church is expected to, without embarrassment, lay everything at the feet of Jesus. If the church is a template of the wife, then the wife should not be embarrassed to lay her millions at the feet of the husband. But there is a caution. First Corinthians chapter 11, order about, said that the head of the man is Christ, the head of, Christ, the, head of the woman. The head of the man is Christ, the head of the woman is the man. That means there is an organogram that should be in place. So if the man is correctly connected to his head, then he deserves that this woman should submit completely to him. And let me tell us this. I, in my study and in my dealings with God preparing for marriage, even before I concluded on who I was going to get married, God showed me the implication of being a husband. And what was the implication? The first thing he showed me is, you want to get married? I said yes. He said the day you get married, from that day, whatever the woman does, good or bad, I hold you accountable. Brothers, whatever the woman does, good or bad, I hold you accountable. We saw the example in Eden. If ate the fruit, God didn't show up. But when Adam ate, Adam, what have you done? Even when Adam was still trying to transfer the blame. That is why God said, women submit to your husband in all things. Because I am going to question your husband about what you did or did not do right in that marriage. So, if your husband says, don't do this one, there is always a balance. Submit because he is going to account to me 
But the balance is that Christ must be seen as the head of that man. Then that man deserves to be the head of that woman. If that equation is balanced, I don't think this thing is going to be a problem. Amen. Amen. Praise God. I jokingly tell women that they didn't force you to marry, number one. Apostle Paul warned people that they shouldn't marry. There's a reason. Marriage is extreme hard work. So, they didn't force you. You chose out of many brothers, you chose that person. Abby, if you choose a goat, you must submit to that goat too. No, no, no. I'm saying so because many people believe that submission is conditional. That I submit to him because he is worthy of submission. No, it's not a scriptural thing. You submit to him because in God's divine order, the wife was designed to submit to the husband. So choose somebody that you will like to submit to. I'll say it again. Many people are toasting you, Abby. Choose the one that you will do what? Like to submit to. Number two, husbands are required to submit unconditionally to Christ. In a marriage, everybody submits. And it's less, no, plus the husband that is submitting to Christ, plus the wife that is submitting to the husband, submission doesn't come naturally. The first thing I realized when I was getting married is that marriage is supposed to be an opportunity for the fruit of the Spirit to be worked out practically in you. You have one person who is guaranteed to annoy you at least two or three times every day. Guaranteed. I don't know how many times I annoy my wife. Before coming for Koinonia, I annoyed her. She practices love, joy, peace, patience, long-suffering. God is using me to teach her that. And God is also using her to teach me that. So you must see marriage as an opportunity to become a better you. Did you hear me? Many people enter marriage with the desire to make their spouse a better person. No. Marriage is an opportunity for you to become a better person. Very important. That being said, we said beforehand that you should marry a person who has documented proof of prior divine direction. Yes or no? If a person has been divinely directed, the bulk of his decisions should have produced divine outcomes. Yes or no? If this person has a track record of divine outcomes, then submission, you only rebel when you believe you have a better idea. Yes or no? If the man has stayed in the presence of God, he warned you last year, this is your friend, leave this friend. You didn't listen. You did something. It backfired. Pew! He now came and loved you and said, don't worry, it's well. Eh? God will make all things work together for good. The next time, before you do anything, will you not ask him, sorry, oh, my husband, there is this friend, Abby. So husbands, the refusal of your wife to submit is a question of the clarity with which you receive instructions of God and the competence with which you convey it to your wife. I never saw a scenario where a divine man, a true leader, being led by God, was consistently questioned by the people that were following him. I don't think so. Wow. wow. Amazing. Hallelujah. Yes, Amen. Now, uh, feminism is a very popular thing around now. And what these people are clamoring for is the equality of men and women. And uh, if you look in details into what feminism is about, uh, personally, I don't really, really think that it is wrong. Now, how people practice it, that's where issues can come up, you know. Uh, and wh why I said this is because, yes, what the man can do, the woman can do it. What the woman can do, the, woman, uh, the man too can do it. We have women that are VCs, we have women that are presidents, we have women that are governors, and they are doing well. So, um, mentally, psychologically, or any other ways you can think of, yes, they can be equal. But then, when you come to things that have, uh, things that have to do with Christ, the way God ordered it is that the, uh, the woman should actually submit to the man. 
Now, it does not mean that the woman is inferior to the, to the, to the man. But it's, it's like, maybe, maybe I, should, I should just use this analogy that um, um, our daddy here is a professor and he is not a VC of ABU. The person that is the VC of ABU is equally a professor. Now, it doesn't mean that he is inferior to the professor, but by the virtue of the position that the VC has, he has to submit to him. So, as um, it, it, Christ promised us abundant life that we are going to have in abundance and all of that. If you really want to enjoy this abundant uh, life, the woman has to submit to the man. And if you have anything other than this, then you can, the likelihood is that you will not enjoy abundant life even in marriage. Thank you. Thank you very much. Amazing. Amazing. I believe that God is speaking to us. Don't worry, we are going to touch on every area, but I think this is very... Um, I'm trusting that God is using these discussions to answer a lot of questions. Praise the Lord. We'll just talk on one issue and then we'll give our daddy mic and I'll ask him a few questions on in-laws. I want to talk about managing challenges in relationships. Um, are challenges proof that God is not in that marriage? Hey, Jimmy. You'll just start and then we'll respond very okay. quickly. Just well, two, two minutes no. each. The mere fact that God is focusing on something attracts the attention of the devil. In fact, the absence of challenges is actually should make you wonder if you are really doing God's will. Because whatever God tries to do, the devil will always try to frustrate. That being said, there are two types of challenges in marriages. We have internally generated challenges, meaning the challenge is coming from the husband or from the wife. Now, those challenges, I personally believe that the leading of the spirit, yieldedness and the fear of God and sacrificial love can solve those internally generated challenges. Then you have externally generated challenges. Things that you did not contribute to and you have no control over. Maybe you get married and your child is delayed for a while. You have to press through that. Um, the goal is when you get married, ensure that the pressure that is coming, sorry sir, if you can hold this, this mic for me, I want to demonstrate something with my hands. Ensure that you are positioned in such a way that pressure, position yourselves in such a way that the pressure cannot pull you apart, but the pressure does what? Pushes you together into God. And that would require a level, thank you sir, that will require a level of humility, vulnerability. That's the ability to be naked and unashamed before your spouse. Men have to take note of this because we men are, are macho. Absolutely. We are very macho. When there's a challenge, you want to go through it alone. And there's a reason for it. Women are emotional. If you tell them... So, 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 challenges in existence. Ah, we are finished. Oh. You're like, that's not why I'm telling you this, right? But a woman who has built herself in faith will not respond that way. So, you sometimes want to protect your wife from the impact of the challenge. So, in such cases, accept the whole load. Step it down like a transformer. Because you are a man, you have the capacity to step down that load. Then give her small because she's a helpmate. And then see how she responds. To who uh, he that is faithful in little, <laughs> more will be given to the person. So choose to be vulnerable and then manage that challenge. Because one thing people forget is that your marriage is a testimony. God has a point to prove with your marriage. Document the challenge, document the way you came out of it, and swear that because of you and your spouse, it will never be a challenge for your children or those after you. Wow amazing amazing so that means that in relationships and marriage and i think we need to pay attention to this there are people whose idea of god being involved in a relationship and marriage is that they are two perfect people and for that reason there would be no challenge whatsoever i don't think that is true success is overcoming many failures are we together now so is the idea is not to get perfection that is exhausting and unnecessary the idea is that you create a system of reconciliation 
that fundamentally you understand that although we love god we are different there are too many reasons like jimmy said why there can be challenges in marriage he gave a very classic example you are married you love god but your wife is unable to put to bed chances are that that irritation you start getting irritated with the same woman you stood in the rain to ask out because you have embarrassment coming from outside but you are trying to protect her from the effect of that embarrassment a time comes it tells on you and you cannot hide it so that anger begins to translate into many things your food is not sweet this food is too cold but it's not about the coldness of the food is that there is something eating you up so the idea is these challenges are inevitable most people run away from challenges into another relationship that they hope does not have challenges or leave one wife to another wife hoping to find a challenge-free marriage uh, i think that all of them will agree that there are so many things that are not necessarily directly within the control of the couple and they must be able to immune themselves and say look no matter what happens whether we are at fault or not we are not going to let this destroy our marriage i wish we had more time to talk on this but uh let's go straight to the issue of external influences and that i would really like our dad to talk about this and i want us to pay attention um i studied um extensively about marriage some years ago and there was a statistics the top three reasons why marriages fail sir the first being money issues we're going to come to that and um the second issue being intimacy issues and you know but the third issue is in-laws and external influences from families who have an idea that when you get married they send two children to come to you and the husband is uncomfortable or have a mother-in-law who just bumps into the house and says it's my son's house you know all these complexities they are destroying a lot of couples daddy talk to us sir we are young people what exactly should be the approach of a christian in-law your son-in-law is here and your daughter and what should be the approach this this is to our parents and to many who will be listening what exactly should be the approach and for a young man and woman who are bleeding right now because of the impact of what the in-laws have done in the marriage what do you have to say sir i think maybe if i will start if the church really will be what is supposed to be to the world to live Speaking, I think everybody must work towards being independent financially. Mm. You see, if you are married to in-laws that are financially independent, you have a son-in-law that is financially independent, I think we'll have a better world. That's true. Yes. But you see, where you don't have that, then you see, uh, I'll say the first thing uh, I advise couple. You see, for me as a father-in-law, and for my life, I vowed in life that I will never depend on anybody. And I think that has been the secret of my life. You see, when I got married and I discovered, you know, I told you I was a teacher. I teach in primary school, not in, not in elementary. Is that right? So I said, teach, sorry, in secondary school. And I know I have very lean resources that day. I think I used to tell my children, then they were so young, they didn't know it. There are instances that I didn't have money. That I will go and be searching my pocket. Maybe I forgot a, a coin in one of the dresses so that I can use it for a day. And when the Lord took me out of, out of that. But you see, even when I was suffering, I made up my mind I was not going to depend on my parents. Because I discovered one thing when we just got married, my parents were saying all kinds of things to the family. And my mother would like to dictate what I would, uh, mm. the, the way I should relate uh, with my wife and other yes. things like that and i said no yes. i don't even want anything from you and sorry daddy I'm... just to, just to he said something that just touched me now um i have had the privilege of counseling people whose mother-in-laws or mothers run the homes of the children mm. they tell how many children should come mm. they tell how much money should go is that true do we have people with these kinds of experiences and so this has destroyed so many people uh the husband is earning this the wife is earning this there are situational report that has to go to the father or the mother they have to smuggle out money from the family 
to cater for the needs of in-laws and the mother said i suffered for my son i must enjoy my sweat and then they call the wife a witch you know the, the complexity around in-laws and families are too much and and that is uh, i have seen families where i'm the first son yeah. he's the first and only son mm -hmm. you know I, I'm, I don't know about the rest but then we have this kind you're the first son too so i think we can relate in a way to this yeah. I have a responsibility. My parents are retired, both of them. And by the grace of God, as much as God has blessed me, I take care of them. My sister is here. Baby, wave your hand. Let them know you are here. Enjoying life free of charge. I pay the price for everything. She's not married yet. <laughs> are, you, are you getting the point now? I mean, if you give her something for wedding, maybe I should be to show, she'll just tell you to forward it to me to pay the money for all of those kinds of things. So, I mean, she's enjoying and I have to take care of her. You see that kind of thing now the truth about the matter is my getting married will not stop that responsibility as it were where then is the balance of my responsibility as an elder son to my parents because they are retired i cannot sit down and watch my mother die but i cannot wreck my home out of self-centeredness because i'm trying to take care of them where then is the balance um how much should a young man pay attention to his family his the family he's coming from as to paying attention to his wife what would you have to say sir it, you know when it comes to you know family issues there's the principle that i always feel you see if it is adopted it will work well for a uh, for a family you see like if you have a jimmy you have hope you see like hope should not relate to me financially. And I think, uh, you see, it's better I go through a Jimmy. Wow. I would like to respect a Jimmy very well because I know if I break my relationship with him, nothing will come out of it. Wow. But if I'm relating with hope, I will certainly disrespect him. The same thing too, if the family of a Jimmy is relating to Jimmy and not hope, if they can get something from him and not through hope, they will never respect hope. Wow. So you see, we must create an environment where the family will respect uh, every member of that. Once that happens, then you see. Remarkable. Remarkable. Yes. You see that the respect for the whole family. Did you get what he's saying? I'm telling you, I'm learning. This is a new revelation for me. Prof is saying that to show how much he's interested in keeping his son in law and his daughter. The marriage working he would rather relate to the husband yes she's his daughter but if there is any major communication he will be involved as a sign that his authority and his place is respected by the time he starts having dealings whether finance or otherwise discussing secret things with hope about her husband that does not concern this she's already sowing a seed of discord there is a party spirit going on there I think that this is very instrumental and many parents should learn are we together now if a Jimmy's well um, his mom's gone to be with the Lord lovely woman but if his dad has um, he has to relate directly to him and ignore hope chances are that their communications will be biased and that will build with time it will start building hatred and resentment so that is giving us something really profound that he would rather go to his son-in-law, to his own daughter, who has now become a Jimmy's wife. So as far as God's organogram is concerned, her place as a wife is more superior to God than her place now as his daughter. Because he has given her. And the Bible says, Therefore shall a man leave, not go out for a while, leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, and they too will become one flesh amazing amazing sir um should in-laws interfere with the happenings in the homes of their children what i mean is yeah, um, yeah, yeah. assuming ogashon and his his wife right now where is the place what is the access point to which their parents can just bump in we've seen in-laws step in to warn the man We've seen in-laws step in to say, you are mistreating my wife. And some can even come and carry the daughter back home. You know, that kind of thing. Where is the place of in-laws? Because sincerely, 
in-laws have destroyed homes they have destroyed families with their self-centeredness and their bias so where is the place of this balancer yeah. the, you know there's only one way to uh, stop this sir. you see like once you see husband and wife have a very good uh, understanding and respect for one yes. another you see they cover one another you see my life no matter who i'm relating with i enlarge my heart so that i don't see anything bad about you i always believe as a human being that i have a lot of shortcomings and i need people i will relate who cover my shortcomings not that you see not that they don't tell me to build it but you see you can advise me at the same time still respect me and honor me despite those shortcomings no. the same thing too you're going to relate with your wife the wife will relate with the husband he has a lot of shortcomings if you don't have a large heart your eyes will always be focused. I think the world sees the negative more than the positive. You see, I'm going to call my wife today to tell a lot of things about me. All the good things I've done for her, she's not likely going to see one. But she's going to see 101 things I've done wrong. I think even in, in news, you see, the world reports the negative and not the positive. I think I was reading over the internet and they posted a picture of one police woman. They, they said she was able to uh, 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 fish out a terrorist group and stop them from carrying out the operation. But nobody reported the case. But you see, the cases, the uh, instances where the terrorists succeeded, they talked so much about it, and then the person who was able to avert it, I think they should have talked more. So the world reports negative than the positive. So in the relationship, we are likely going to take in the negative and not the positive. And that's why you see, like, if you're going into a relationship, enlarge your heart. So that, you see, come what may. You see, I'll, I'll say this, that truly speaking, no pressure should make you tell a relation of yours what your husband is doing wrong. If you cannot tolerate it, at best, see a man of God. Or see a very close friend. I believe a man of God certainly will be a better person to see than you are. Even if your father is a pastor. Don't see him because when it comes that time, his mind must change. <laughs> wow. Yes. Wow. So, it, so if you're relating it and you are taking it, you see, like if I if hope covers it, Jimmy, and does not allow me to see any negative thing about him, I'm going to honor him. That's right. In all situations. But the moment she allows me to see anything negative about him, then you see, like you see, I'm subtly by nature, I'm supposed to tolerate hope more than. I think you know it's like that. I tolerate, but you see, that's why children find it difficult to live with other parents. You think that we, they, they may receive better treatment from other parents than their parents. But the moment the people do a little thing, because God has created in our heart a soft spot for people who are relations than those who are not our, uh, our relations. And once we understand it, then you see that we try to keep whatever that is not going on well. Uh, in the family to our safe and if the pressure is so much that we cannot bear it we should see a more spiritually sound brother who will give us godly counsel you see that a counsel i've known in instances where you have so much pressure and you meet a man of god he talks to you as if the, he, he has lifted up the, uh, 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 of you and you see sometimes too like as a relationship where you keep these things and you pray over it you see, sir, I, I don't, uh, I had problem with my wife very well when we were about nine years of marriage or, or so. Mm. In fact, I never knew that we were going to survive that prayer. But you see, I kept on fasting, I kept on praying. And then you see, there was a day I was sleeping. And then I just knew I was carrying a lot like this. And then in the dream, the, the Lord fell off my head. And you see, that it was in God from fire. And then I saw me come out of one place. You see, after that, you see, the Lord just gave me a heart. Oh. Very pure and clean heart. Mm. That when my wife came and she was talking about the issues, I was just laughing. And I think the, the, the heart the Lord created for me, it was flowing and dissolved everything. And since then, we have never had any bridge. I'm not saying we've not had differences. But we have never had any differences that yes. set in our existence as a, as a family. Wow. Amazing. I, I wish we had more time. But then on a final note, let me just, we have to move to other issues. But then 
I think I want to point out something that um, they have all said, and particularly our daddy prof has said. I teach the School of Ministry students, and um, one of the courses is, is ministry um, or personal transformation, really. I teach on what I call the organogram of priorities. How that a man must know the levels of his priority in life. And this is the templates that I give the students. That the first priority of any man is maintaining his relationship with God. His submission to the authority of the Christ. The second priority of that man is his family. Not in-laws. Not his mother and father. His family, meaning his nuclear family, his wife and children. And under family, his first priority is his, to his wife and not children. She was the reason why they came. She's the reason why they will live safely. They are only there for 10, 20 years and then they will leave. So your organogram of priority should be number one to God. Your submission to God. Number two, your wife. Number three, your children. Are we together now? then the submission to your assignment right and then relationships and other things every time you break that rank there will be trouble if you exalt children more than your wife there will be trouble you exalt wife or husband more than god there will be trouble so we need to get back to rearranging those priorities again there is absolutely nothing in my life personally that can take the place of god there's no point even asking a debate on it you see that when i get married my priority will shift automatically automatically i'll still love koinonia i love everybody with all my heart but the moment i get married i can miss koinonia to maintain my relationship with my wife and i'll do it without praying about it without fasting about it there'll be no apologies whatsoever i will make sure that when i come for koinonia i come with my wife happy there's no faking it to come around and they say such a humble man and the woman is saying this devil of a man no 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 it must be resolved at home before we come to the pulpit and then my children also you see um well i didn't have the best of experience with my dad i don't want to go into all those details we don't have time but i really plan to be an award-winning father and every gentleman here should be pressing towards that i've seen I've seen their children, all of them here. I mean, Hope and the rest, they're award-winning children. Pastor Alpha, we've seen all their children, award-winning children. And these children were raised intentionally. It was not a mistake. Are we together now? So I think that um, the lesson we need to get here, if I'm to draw two things, is the fact that the fear of the Lord cannot be downplayed in any area of family life. Notice how they keep making reference to God. The fear of the Lord and then keeping priorities right. Praise the Lord. Uh, let's go to finances. We have to go to finances. That, that's really very important. We have to go to finances. I, I, I really had one more question on, on um, marriage. Would, would you let me ask that question? Is that all right? Dr. Jeleesa, please help us. When a young man is on the process to get married, can you guide us from step A? I have found a lady. What is the next step? Do I run away with her? Do I meet her parents? What exactly do I do? You know? Yes. Um, after finding the lady... Please listen, brothers. And there is mutual consent on the part of the two. I think the next thing is to get the parents involved. And um, if you can also have the consent of the parent, then I think, the, I, I, I'm sorry, it may sound wrong, but I think that's when the church can be involved. My own personal, yes. That's when the church can be involved. The parent first, you know, an individual first, the parent, then the church. And after that, the families can come together, pick a date, and, and that's it. Okay, wow. So that's the step once the, the people agree and they're happy, the next thing should be parents. Because I know there are lots of pastors and churches who say ignore parents. If I as the pastor refuses you, no matter what the parents say, it's nonsense. You know? So he's now correcting it. And I think I agree with him. Biblically, the first and greatest spiritual authority uh, in an ideal sense, there are exceptional cases, 
is a family you cannot go and begin to meet a pastor and discuss on marriage whereas the parents are not even aware are we together now on a final note everybody is going to speak what is your position on elaborate wedding waiting for an uncle to come from china five million naira i mean pure water customized is strangling a lot of gentlemen there are people who are ready to move but this barrier has stopped them i mean i know times that people use hundred thousand to get married right now uh what do you think is an average budget for a conservative in zaria i think you should not be talking of anything less than one million auditorium balloons fixing everything so what exactly hold on please well, this is on a final note what exactly is the role of elaborate wedding you know is is it biblical should we allow it i mean why must we have to do all of those kinds of things is there a place for that is it necessary must a gentleman have five million to put on ground and have his house built by himself must everybody buy a shwebi? must they buy suit for the boy who is going to hold the ring you know all these kinds of things where is the balance pastor alpha please take it and then we'll run it through praise god um i don't think it is right to be under pressure for elaborate wedding mark my words i didn't say that having certain things in your wedding is wrong that's not what i said but being under pressure for a kind of very elaborate do this do that buy two suits the one you wear in church is different from the one you wear in reception the two wedding gowns and then the person doing the makeup must come from so so and so place and the makeup must be two hundred thousand and all that there's nothing wrong with having it but being under pressure for it is not correct let me use a practical example my wedding i wedded because god told me it was time as okay it's time said yes so we agreed and then fixed it and then i saw certain signs the way my mother-in-law who has gone to be with the lord now she was actually the one that gave us the date and all that and then in preparation i didn't have a job at the time i got married all i had was okay god said it's time and then i asked him for a proof he said all things are ready and i was preparing i wanted to do my traditional that saturday morning so that there will be no need to cook two this thing, one for traditional one for wedding so we'll cook the same food pack some for the traditional in the parlor then and then my wife who said okay is their last born they are not going to agree so eventually if you attended my wedding it was a bit elaborate but god paid for everything no single pressure was on me i was not at a point somebody asked me what suit are you going to wear i said ah, there's one suit i have are they going to chase me out because i wore an old suit so if god does not provide it somebody called that was how my mind was i made up my mind no human being on earth was going to put me under pressure but everything we desired to happen happened but there was no pressure so i don't think that i should be under pressure to get certain things done write the vision and just make it clean and i think god bless you thank you that is a yeah. elaborate wedding what's your position on it yeah. sir? well we'll just run it through maybe one one minute so that we can just move quickly yes, yes sir you see seriously i always say that i must be frank and i hope nobody will be disappointed here <laughs> you see when you come and you tell me you want to marry my daughter and you see no matter how godly you are if you don't have means of livelihood truly speaking the family will be broken because you know, that's the truth you see you see the, the moment your wife stays three four days and has not eaten she'll never talk the way you met her in her family so you, so in as much i don't believe you don't need to have so much money but you see like a, a husband must be responsible you should be able to feed your family no matter how hard uh, 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 you see the country is. and at, at whatever time once you cannot feed your family i think seriously you are not supposed to be married wow. so i think the first thing if somebody is thinking of marriage it's not that you have kept so much money 
But you should know that you have stepped on something. Yes. That you should be able to feed your, your family and not to starve them. You see, look, I may be very disciplined. I may not have good clothes. I may not have good food. I can survive. But my children may not be as disciplined as me. And if when I open them up, they may do certain things that I'll find it very difficult to, uh, to control. And that's why we say, well, you see the truth to a person who does not have the means of livelihood can all rule his conscience. I don't know whether I'm saying the truth. Because you see, like, if you don't have means of survival, people are likely going to rule your conscience. Your judgment certainly can, it can be disturbed when you don't have anything. There are instances you see that people are bound to do certain things, not because they wanted to, but because the pressure on them was so, so much. You see, if you have your children and you don't have school fees, you don't have, truly speaking, you may do certain things that you don't believe you do them. And that's why you see the, uh, be, uh, you see to be in a safer side is better, it's not age. Even though we know uh, uh, psychologically, they say at the age of 25, you know, like people lower than that in their teenage, they are full of fantasies. Yeah. <laughs> and that's why you say, like, sometimes you say you want, to, you want a tall person, sometimes you want a short person. The mind is not stable. But at the age of 25, every man is very stable at that particular uh, time. Even if you are not a Christian, you discover that your mind will be more stable than when you are younger. And that's why you see that sometimes they say, well, it's good that you attain a certain age before you get married. But you see, for Christian, even at the age of 12, you meet somebody, I used to say that his wisdom and knowledge is above somebody that is 90 years old. <laughs> yeah. So you see, he's spiritually discerned. Is that not true? But not all of us, we are all Christians, but not all of us that drive that inspiration that he drives. And no, no not all of us that will stand the pressure that a person will be able to withstand. And you see, that's why the, even the Bible says we deal with people with understanding. Yeah. Yes. So, truly speaking, I advise everybody. You see, like, even when we are saying relations, you see, attending to relationship, you see, Seba, when you, you, you see, when you love the relations of, uh, 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 of your spouse, and you are hardworking, you have the material resources, you will be able to take care of them, sir. Because you see, there's nothing wrong to take care of your rela uh, the relations of your spouse. It's only when you don't have the money. Is that not true? That you cannot. But if you have the money, you see, like if I have the money, I would like to train everybody in my wife's family. Is that not true? Yes, because if they are trained, certainly in future, they will even be the people that will assist you. I don't know whether what I'm saying is making sense. Yes. So, but you see, financially, you may not be capable. And that's why I've always tell everybody, work very hard to be financially independent. Just to me, no family should depend on another family. Because I believe God, you see, who God has created on the face of the earth, he has given him the capacity to take care of his family. You see, he has certain virtues that is only him that can instill to the family. And the family is supposed to change the world through those virtues that he received from God. But if he's not financially stable, he may not be able to stand on those things and defend them. You've received this from God. You are supposed to defend it. You are supposed to pass it to your children. But once you, 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 you see, once you are not independent, when you depend on other people, then you see the amount of pressure. You know, they say whoever that pays the piper dictates the truth. I don't know who it is. So you see, like, if you, if you have somebody you are depending on as a family, whether you like it or not, there are certain things you must take from that family before you survive. But if your family is financially uh, independent, you see, you can stand, you can guide what God has given unto you. You can be able to tell your hope. You see, like I, my hope is here. I don't even, even my brothers, I don't allow them to go there and stay maybe more than one day or two days because I believe there are certain virtues I've received from God I'm the only one that can pass it to my children. At the moment, you see, because you are not financially capable, and you, are, you see, like, there are so many families, they have so many children, they cannot take care of them, they send them to other families. Sometimes you see that those families are not godly. And before they come back to you, you see that they are blind 
certain things that will be strange to the family. And if you don't take time to corrupt the other children in the family that you spend time trying to bring them uh, well, up. Thank you so much, Daddy. Amazing, amazing. Let's appreciate Daddy. We'll go straight into finance. Just a few questions, straight to the point. Ejimi, why are Christians broke? Hallelujah. Why exactly. Let's talk about this money thing. Why are Christians broke? Um, well, as a consolation, it's not only Christians that are broke, unbelievers too are broke, but the apparition is children are, uh, Christians are sons of kings. So why are they broke? Um, I think the first reason why Christians are broke is because Christians have refused to recognize that they are responsible for their financial situation. That's the number one thing. Um, like you say, sir, um, something you know, something you don't know is responsible for your current uh, limitation. Something you know, but you have refused to believe is responsible for your current limitation. And something you believe, but you have refused to consistently act upon is responsible for your limitation. So why are Christian um, believers, uh, why are Christians broke? Number one, they have refused to take recognition and responsibility for their current financial situation. Talk to the average believer. When you talk to him about soul winning, mm, he has a paradigm. He has a definite plan for it. Talk to him about marriage. He has a definite plan for it. He can speak with specificity. Talk with them about wealth, finances. You start hearing all sorts of vagueness. Grandiose vagueness. Do you understand? I put a post up recently on my Facebook and I put a photo of three cars. I now said that they should choose one. And some people just put and said, all oh, three. I was just laughing. I said, are you aware that these cars are costing not less than 80 million? The casualness with which they said it made me know that they think it's going to come from heaven. So the first thing is a failure to accept and recognize that it's their responsibility. The second reason why Christians are broke, in my opinion. Please listen. Um, are we getting blessed? Am I still with you? Please, I want us to all pay attention. We'll just wrap this up shortly, but I'm, we may not have the time. I took for granted that we may not really have the time to discuss this much, but I think the two issues we're talking about is really very, very serious. And I want us to pay attention, especially in, on our finances, even as we talk about this. So Jimmy is talking about why Christians are broke. Number one, he says lack of recognition, that they are responsible for their financial destiny. Go ahead, sir. Um... The, 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 the reason I, I say this is God told us in Genesis 1 verse 29 that we should be fruitful. We should multiply. We should, so that's not a suggestion. It's a commandment. And many Christians have not as accepted it and owned it as a commandment. The second reason I believe is a poverty mindset. Especially Christians in Africa. We were conditioned. We live in such abject poverty that subconsciously we have accepted it. If you talk to an American, there are certain things they take for granted. Good roads, houses. Why? Because they are exposed to some levels of wealth. So because we, are, we live in Africa, we have subconsciously been conditioned to accept poverty as a default state. And this poverty mindset displays itself in different ways. Number one, a criticism, a discomfort when you talk about wealth. I ask a the average Christian talk about many things. You won't see that. Just let them see a pastor in a jeep. Their first default response is criticism or discomfort. And the truth of life is whatever you criticize, your mind shuts you away from it. And because we are critical, uncomfortable with, you don't care to ask questions, you just shut your mind. So that's, that's a very real reason. We have been conditioned to be critical of wealth. And then the last thing I believe is um, financial illiteracy. A lack of understanding of the rules of wealth. And there is nobody qualified. The average wealthy person is selfish and stingy. Or he believes you don't honor his sacrifice. So he will not be predisposed to helping you so we don't have that attitude that can attract those who can help us and teach us how to become wealthy so lack of recognition poverty mindset 
financial illiteracy. Yes, Dr. Sir, please, can you buttress on it? Why are Christians poor? We really need to deal with this. I mean, I, I personally am concerned about the way very well-meaning Christians who love God, pastors, so many people, you know, this poverty thing is terrible. People have prayed about it, fasted about it. It just doesn't seem to go. Why are people really poor? He has de dealt very well with this. But I just want to add that I think one other thing that Christians do is they put so much of all of this responsibility, financial responsibility, on God mm. and not on themselves. Wow. That there's a place of God, no doubt about that. Uh, opening the uh, windows of heaven, blessing coming down and all of that. But then there has to be something in your own hand that God has to bless. Now, if you don't have something that God will bless, he might as well be looking at you, you know. And so, so we should not underestimate our part in partnering with God to see that we are blessed. Thank you. Wow, amazing. My body is already itching me now. He just said something that is forcing me to have to speak. I plan to keep quiet and just let them talk on this issue. But now that it has come out, they made a statement that was very interesting. Why? Are Christians poor and a Jimmy said something that is very important we call this the law of recognition listen it is very important right I have passion to let us get this before we begin to pray the law of recognition states that everything is available but you need to be aware of its presence way before gravity was discovered what we call discovery is simply an awareness of a reality that has always been there when it becomes aware to you then we call it discovery are we together now so many believers are not even aware that they are responsible for their financial destinies then he made a point that was very interesting the conditioning of our minds every time i mention the word rich wealth million prosperity for many of us here what i just said is deception fraud wickedness carnality that's what you heard are you seeing that now so we have conditioned our mind to associate wealth with the negative once you see a wealthy person you just say ah all these young people who are rich they are four one niners or they are they are some kind of bad people or they are drug dealers you know so until that conditioning changes and then he said something number three which is very important lack of the understanding of the laws everybody say financial prosperity say after me has laws one more time say financial prosperity has laws and then dr jelaya just hit it to the nail he said we leave everything to god bishop oedico said something he said any christianity any practice of christianity that makes God absolutely responsible for the outcome of your life is an irresponsible Christianity. So there are so many believers, and I say this with a bias to northern Christians. We have this mindset, Hakane Allah Sharia. Are we together now? The northern conservative evangelical Christianity has made us to kick prosperity out. Are we together? So we hate it, we resent it, and we think if God should bless me then he has the power to bless me the cattle on a thousand hill belongs to god and then we don't do anything about it so that's really very important because i say this sincerely many of us sitting here outside and uh, the thousands of people following online are victims of this so we sit down and wish what we resent and we don't have it and we're angry and we're saying lord i don't understand why i am serving you i'm praying and so on and so forth so he said something and i want to pick it from there dr jelly said we have a role i call it a partnership and i want you to buttress please what exactly is the role of god in a man's finances and what is our own role pastor alpha can you take it from there please what exactly is the role of god what where does god play the part and where do we come in praise god um, one of the just one minute will we'll okay. take two, two, two minutes into one of the very, very popular scripture when it comes to that Christians use to put all the responsibilities on God is the issue of tithing Malachi 3 verse 10 bring ye all the tithe into my into the house that there may be meat in the storehouse prove me 
hear it if I will not open the windows of heaven. And believers see the windows of heaven as one day, maybe 12 midnight, at the time everybody is sleeping, they will just come out and some dollars will be falling. He opened, opens the windows of heaven and he gives you ideas. He gives you favor. He gives you opportunities. And it is your responsibility to prepare so that you can maximize the opportunity when it comes. Wow. For example, I, I started preparing for what I'm doing a long time ago. I sat because somebody like me is a victim of this kind of message, the kind of Christian background I come from. They fight anything that has to do with financial prosperity and all that. So I got to start learning some of these things myself at a very late age. And when I discovered that my financial well-being is tied to my assignment in life, is, is part of my being acceptable to God, part of my, my hearing from God, well done, that good and faithful service, servant. So I tied it into everything I was doing. And I started preparing when I discovered that this is the primary thing that God wants me to do. And every other aspect of my lifting is connected to this thing that I'm okay. doing. So I started preparing. So that aspect of preparing for the opportunities that God brings is an aspect that the Christian body is neglecting. So you see that God can open the door. For example, Jimmy posted something recently. Kaduna State Government brought out a master plan of five years, what they want to do. And Jimmy said, download and read carefully for opportunities may be in it. I don't know how many people saw it. I've downloaded it, I'm studying it because there are opportunities in it. I heard a message recently, somebody calculated the amount of money within two hours circumference of Kaduna State. And they run into trillions of Naira. And the question he asked is, how much of this will get into your hand? And how much of it will get into your hand is the value that you have prepared yourself to contribute to the system. Because money is not created, they change hand. And they change hand based on your contribution to the sustainability of the system that we're in. Thank you. Amazing. Amazing. Now, um, I, would, I, would, I would allow Daddy, I'll come to him again. Jimmy, can you take it from there? Now that we agree that there are spiritual laws, there are physical laws, please help the people because I believe the question many people are asking is, okay, I'm a tither. I'm not getting anything. Is there more to this? Because many of we pastors have taught people once you tithe, the general message about finance in the body of Christ is if you want to be rich, tithe and give go to bed things will work what's your opinion sir very quickly please two minutes let's try to, to touch very quickly on tithing and on giving there's a reason why pastors tend to emphasize it that's because the office of the pastor benefits from tithing and offering i will say that very critically but the pastor is offering spiritual value on a consistent basis we are here you are getting something yes or no You are getting inspiration, hope, miracles. You don't merchandise it because it came from God. But certain aspects of it, you demonstrate your gratitude via your substance. That is exactly what God expects every believer to do. Offer a value. Offer a service. Offer a product that will be of such high value that you can exchange it. But what Christians want is to collect without discussing what they will give. I need to let us know that our prosperity is tied to our offering. Offering does not mean offering in church. Your offering is what you have to offer. Please, let's say that. My offering offering is what I have have to offer. That's the number one reason. So, the question is, what do I have to offer? The first thing, sir, in my opinion, is your divine assignment. The reason why you were created. What problem did God put you on earth to solve? And it is always threefold. A spiritual problem, and a secular problem, and a transformational problem. The problem is we focus only on the spiritual. Has the internet blessed anybody? Yes. Has motor vehicles blessed anybody? Yes. Has electricity blessed anybody? Yes. Is the, this mic blessing somebody? Yes. To God, all things come from him. So the first question is, what has God put in me, right, that is an assignment for me to establish on the earth? The second thing is, what are my God-given abilities? So first, sir, what is my God-given assignment or my God-given task? The second, what is my God-given ability or my God-given tool? 
sadly, the first one is only revealed in the place of, um, of encounter, the burning bush experience, where God tells you what he has done. I use the story of Moses. You realize that Moses at age 40 realized that he had a call of greatness to liberate the Israelites, and then he goes and he separates um, an Egyptian bullying a, an Israelite, and he kills him. And then he sees two Israelites, and he says, why are you guys fighting? Sensing that they would know that God has called him to be a deliverer. And they asked him a question. Who made you a ruler and a judge over us? If you encounter wealth, if in your quest for wealth, it will ask you, who made you a ruler and a judge? It is the God of the burning bush that you will go back and say, there's a spirit called mammon. So you have to have that encounter where you settle it with God. And God says, I am giving you X, Y, Z. So, so, so assignment. Then you can say, lift up your head, O ye gate, and be lifted up. And that being said, sir, the place of your God-given assignment, your God-given tools, then your passion, your purpose. And then the second one, sir, I will talk about is your portfolio. Extremely important. Your portfolio. You will never amass wealth if you don't have a system that leverages and grows money for you when you are not there. If you intend to work for every penny, you will work. Have we not had people that work for 40 years? They retire and it looks as if they never worked. Because God didn't design it like that. Look at Abraham. Anytime God is talking about wealth, he talks about cattle. The ability, you just go, mate one male and one female, and it brings. Without you necessarily being responsible for that multiplication process. You must have a portfolio. You must have a system that grows. Be it land for agricultural purposes, or land for real estate purposes, or land for mining and extractive purposes. Be it financial markets, stocks, portfolios, currencies, gold. Gradually you begin to save. And lastly, sir, you must have a clear-cut understanding of these five things. Number one, how to earn. Number two, how to spend. Number three, how to save. Number four, how to borrow. Number five, how to invest. I believe personally, every believer should have a medium understanding of these five things. How to earn, how to spend, how to save, how to borrow, how to invest. Wow, amazing. Are you learning something? Truly, truly, brothers and sisters, there's no magic about wealth. All those, all those foolish things we do around in church, we just mock ourselves for nothing. There is a very powerful paradigm, very straight to the point. Let me allow uh, doctor and his wife to respond on this. Um, now he is talking about that there is more. Aside from tithing and giving, uh, there's the place of value. Please take it from there, sir. The place of value? Yes, I, I, um, I think I'm reading a book uh, presently, and the book is uh, The Outliers. And there are two, two very important, or maybe I should just summarize the whole thing about the book, just two points. And uh, one of them is the place of excellence, and the other is the place of time and uh, chance happening to them all. Or in other words, the lines falling into one in pleasant places. Now, uh, we have, we've been saying that we need to, okay, the part of God, uh, um, one side opens the heavens and all of that. But on one side, excellent side. Whatever it is that one doing, whatever one, uh, like, whatever one's hand finds to do, one should do it with all might. One should be excellent at it, whatever it is, whatever it is. And uh, uh, that is what will create value for what, what, what one has to offer. Like he said, offering. That is what will create value for what you are offering. And that is what men will pay for. Thank you. Thank you so much. Shade, what can you say about it? The concept of value. Um, it's, it's not, let's, let's demystify this thing. I know we're out of time. But, Praise God. Yes. I think I would like to say it specifically for some of us, our ladies. I, think, I don't think we should be afraid of starting small. No matter how little it is it's good to have a big plan it's good to dream big and all of that but no matter what it is you have what is that small thing you have like elisha told the the widow what do you have and then she said she had oil and she kept pouring pouring and pouring but there had to be something very small what is that little thing in your hand you can plait hair you can you can sew clothes you can knit you can sell bags of pure water, even if it's 20 naira you're making on each. With time, it will grow. God rewards diligence. It's wonderful to work in a bank. 
it's wonderful it's wonderful to have a federal government appointment it's wonderful to work in the cbn and all of that but before those ones come there should be something in our hands that is working for us the bible says something about the proverbs 31 woman that she seeks out wool and flax and develops it with willing hands wool and flax are raw materials so it's important for us to identify those things that look in there that look like um the crude state they look raw they don't look fanciful they don't look attractive but then with willing hands they can become beautifully finished products praise the lord okay you are itching to answer okay so so you just say something two minutes okay i want to say something i started doing business when i was on campus i was making and selling shirts so i want to say that for those who are lucky fortunate to be insulated by the campus environment this is a good time to start practicing not because of the income no but because of the transformation that will happen to you as you begin to master the laws of business most people the reason why you should start small is not don't despise starting small it's not about the profit of starting small it's about the things you will learn customer relations do you understand so that when god brings you to your next level the same way joseph stood in front of pharaoh and after he had explained it wasn't his first time of interpreting a dream he had been interpreting small 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 dreams for small 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 people so the moment he stood before pharaoh that competence was undeniable he just knew okay this is a king i have to package it to be fit for a king but the same competence so let's focus on doing business for the transformations that will happen to us as a result of doing business so that the day god brings you into a bigger opportunity like proportion you just click and drag and you'll be able to do the exact same thing on a bigger scale which is why i always tell people whatever it is just start small and focus on the transformations that will occur to you as well amazing please i want everybody to write this down very quickly write this down the concept of something for nothing does not exist in the realm of finances Please write it and understand it once and for all. The concept of something for nothing is the illusion we drive ourselves with in church. The body of Christ has been brainwashed into believing God is an errand boy who is forced to bring money to us to show he died for us. And we have the laziest set of people as believers. We have the most less, uh, I mean, those who are... Uh, very backward in innovation, witty ideas, concepts. You know, he talked about excellence. All of these things, listen, the concept, prosperity works on the law of exchange. The law of reward. Are we together now? So that's what I want us to write. The concept of nothing for, so, for um, something for nothing does not exist. In the table of greatness, everybody must bring something. You must... Bring something upon that table and then partake of the wealth upon that table. Having said that, please, I want to reconcile something. The Bible says, through wisdom is a house built, not through favor. Are we together now? When you tithe, watch this, when you tithe and you give, you satisfy the spiritual conditions for open heavens. Now, money will come, ideas will come, wisdom will come. But it is not tithing that manages and builds wealth. It's one thing for money to come. It's another thing to master the art of managing it and multiplying it. I define financial prosperity, uh, among other definitions, as having availability of financial resources alongside the ability to replenish, to manage, to multiply it, and to maintain its availability. If you cannot maintain what God has given you, you are poor. So your tithe keeps opening the heavens. Money is coming, but you consume it and it finishes and you say, Lord, it has finished. So God is performing his own role. He gives seed to the sower, bread to the eater. Are we together now? So he sends you money and then you come and stand on koinonia ground and testify. Praise the Lord. I gave a tithe. I sowed the seed into apostles' life. 1.5 million came. That 1.5 million looks like a harvest. It's not the harvest of your destiny. It's the harvest of the seed you have sown, which should become another seed that should bring your harvest. Are we together now? So I think that the natural laws of wealth teach us how to operate the systems to do something with the resources and the ideas that come from heaven. The natural laws are all about managing what comes through favor so if one million comes through favor you should never beg again if you understand the laws of the spirit 
are we together now so we have believers receiving things from god and waiting oh somebody gave me house somebody gave me this somebody gave me that and then we always have and then don't have we have and then we don't have we have and then it finishes but there is, when we have financial intelligence and understand the laws of wealth right it keeps accelerating from glory to glory that's part of what Ejimi was saying please write this down I, I, i'm itching I, I wish we had time i really wish this was a night vigil but then we have to find somewhere to stop but write this down prosperity works upon the reward system of the kingdom the reward system of the kingdom the reward system of the kingdom and what is the formula for wealth and abundance please write this down it has changed my life i believe it's changed every one of our facilitators here whether this is known or not anywhere it was practiced wealth came write this down our rewards in life will always be in exact proportion to three things our rewards financial rewards now especially in life will always be in exact proportion to three things ready number one the demand for what we do the demand for what we do you remain poor when there is no demand for what you do that's why there is no longer night hell, as it were because there is no demand that's why the sales of typewriters are no longer there there is no demand are we together that's why 3310 has run out of the market there is no demand so the question is is there a demand and we live in a world where making wealth is so easy now it takes no particular brains because there is a demand for almost everything the world has been globalized there is a demand for almost everything are we together now pastor alpha is a man of god offering spiritual value and that in itself the spiritual value he's offering is there a demand for it go and ask demons i mean we cast out demons every week we are healing the sick you are gathered here because there is a demand for what we are doing so if you get sad that i'm prosperous i find that very ridiculous anywhere there is a demand even if you don't like me are we together now i preach an average of three messages every week and that i am dispensing spiritual value i don't do that for money but the spiritual law of reward is such that whether you offer the service free or you sell it you are authorized to be rewarded are we together so it comes as honorarium it comes as whatever blessings right so i if i keep being competent with god i get to a point where the honorariums the prophet offerings all the monies that come to me from ministry will be sufficient for me to build a financial stream around it are we are we are we getting what i'm saying now so pastor alpha is being rewarded more so he is a lecturer offering value our daddy is a prof what does that tell you he has attained the highest position in his profession so is 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 unthinkable to be surprised that he's a millionaire i mean i mean that that's not something to pray about are we together now a jimmy is a man of god the spiritual value is there right he's an entrepreneur he's paid the price to build himself and understand business and work and you know being a communicator of god's financial principles to the body of christ that is value are we together he can organize a seminar just teaching you this all these things you hear us share are things that people pay over hundred thousand for a three-day seminar and those who communicate it receive the value that's why when believers fail i think god is really sad because we get free in church nobody really pays anything free in church are we together now dr jelly it wasn't too long he backed his phd i mean you can see as simple as he is very intelligent personality you see he had to move now to be trusted with a greater responsibility in his profession he will not beg for bread it's not the issue of demons are alive whatever it is he has value that is in demand are we together now same thing with shade his wife right shade is a lecturer in leather research right she's a lecturer in leather research their combined salary enough will drive every demon of poverty that wants to come to their family there are two ways to drive demons one is prayers two is knowledge are we together now so let me tell you this i say this without every sense or, or any sense of apology every one of the people here are absolutely competent people aaron is there aaron is a logistics person aside from other businesses and things that he does and then he's a man of god too 
right but right now there are i don't know how many weddings are on his table to organize the logistics for them and for every one of those weddings i don't think he should be getting anything less than forty thousand. so let's assume there are 20 weddings on his table is it a miracle to produce four hundred thousand? are you getting what i'm saying now so that we make it so miraculous that money is coming it's a formula the demand for what you do number two your ability to do what you do incompetence does not pay that was the area i wanted our daddy to talk about but our time is gone i'm sorry i have to be the one saying these things by myself i wish that we could hear their perspectives do you have the ability to do what you do everybody say competence say one more time say competence that guy is on the on the camera this guy is on another camera this is competence they were trained are we together now you want them to to um video cover your wedding you are going to pay them it's not going to be free are we together yes i'm a man of god but listen it's not just the anointing that produce all these things i daniel understood by books there is a place of study there's a place of diligence are we together now i didn't learn the things that i know financially and otherwise just by luck you can see um a doctor telling you he's on a book reading he's currently reading a book you can see pastor alpha saying he downloaded something and he's listening to it these are people who are in a way already successful in their field but they are competent please write it down i destroy incompetence in my life from today incompetence will make anyone poor whether the devil is there or not if god decides to change satan right now people will still be poor are we together now so it is important ability 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 shade and her husband will never beg for bread Ejimi's wife makes cakes she had a uk certification right hope was doing well before she got married but here and there she was still there but all through she she's an economist and she already has a long time goal and you see god in his witness con, uh, in his in his in, in his, his, his his might you know connecting her to a, a financial person you know made her study economics and then hope spent all her time from marriage building herself she got a uk based certification there are not many of those institutions in the world she was so competent when she came back now being an authority in pastries and all of these things she made cake for me in fact you know daddy you know organized the family to make cake for me and i was so touched when she made the cake the cake is almost finished because there have been so many people just coming to take a piece of it now hope will be able to make cake for kaduna state government and they'll pay her one million she can make cake for buari during his birthday or any day he wants to celebrate are we together now god can now lift her to house of assembly to make cake for people because favor is when preparation or competence meets opportunity don't pray for god to bring opportunities when you are not prepared you will blow it and that door will close forever there's a gentleman i don't know if he's here he came with sam today that gentleman is a medical is a medical doctor now he he, he discovered something witty inventions he discovered a machine or he designed a machine that can detect um heart disease without having you just touch it in your heart and it interprets it i mean they just gave him the patent the license for the mass production when that guy came to me with sam and i saw his presentation i was blown away i said this is a kingdom ambassador this guy is going to make the kingdom proud today he came with gifts and i mean piles of money in an envelope just dropped it and brought it for me and in my mind you see that's my own share of the value i added to him are we together no 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 i'm not laughing everybody has a piece of the pie according to your contribution because when he came i looked at him i said you're an intelligent person and because i have a relationship with the holy spirit and he called me the holy ghost said tell him to go and meet professor knock being a nobel prize nominee he would be in the best position and then this and i i met him when he met professor knock as it is right now arrangement has been made for him to go to ministry of uh, to abuja to the ministry of science and technology they are going to take his work and that guy has gone forever his generation will never beg again even if the machine is one one naira many people are dying of heart disease there is a demand for it his ability to have received from the holy spirit 
are we together now if that guy were incompetent like many of us are and we keep crying and saying god bless me bless me and god is saying make room for the blessing with your competence are we together now don't say i make hair don't say i do this this is somebody's idea we didn't have to pray to buy it this person is probably on holidays abroad and we're buying his product that's what Jimmy is talking about he's designed an autonomous system that brings him wealth whether or not he is there are we together now this is amazing people listen to koinonia messages when i'm sleeping and to them i'm awake preaching whereas i'm sleeping and then we receive alerts of project 10,000. we are sleeping the finance department is sleeping but money is coming into the account because a message could go and transcend time listen guys i'm telling you this from the depth of my heart if you want to get out of poverty you will if you do not want to you will remain there hoping that one day in the sweet by and by a miracle will happen are we together now the third reason as we prepare to round off on this is the difficulty in replacing you listen no man is indispensable but there are people that are hard to find a replacement that should be your position to remain wealthy the degree to which we could find another professor Madison is difficult madam Ladi is in our midst very very intelligent please let's celebrate her she's sneaking hiding somewhere there and with all due respect ma she sent me a text this morning that she was going for a lecture in kaduna and then had to finish there do a few things and rush back and come for koinonia do you think she will beg this is not the issue of prayer it's issue of value 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 are we together now so please this this magic thing we expect to happen in our finances even if favor comes we will never receive anything because we are not contributing right so the demand for what we do our ability to do it and then uh the difficulty in replacing us last point and then we'll just appreciate the facilitators i'm so sorry our time is gone but we still have to pray i wish we had so much time they have so much to be able to just pour out but um let's talk about multiple streams of income finally everybody is going to participate um we all have agreed that the salary a man earns may not be enough right while we receive tithe and all of that um are multiple streams of income important what not necessarily what they are but how they affect people positively or negatively go ahead sir amen just please two two minutes let's work with the time multiple streams of income is very very important because um i'm a lecturer for instance and when asu goes on strike for example and i think it affects prof too when asu goes on strike after three months your salary is stopped Am I correct, sir? Yeah. after three months if the strike exceeds three months they stop paying salary if the strike lasts for eight months that means you live for five months without salary coming in so within those five months how are you going to survive that means there's a need to diversify okay so it's important that you don't place your financial supply on one source of income alone there should be different like Jimmy mentioned there is farming like i was talking with some investors uh, some people in kaduna they are into some is an organization they are trying to promote ginger production right now they just entered an agreement with a u.s based company who is looking for major ginger supply and they're trying to is something i cannot display here right now and then i ran into a guy who is part of the organization and he was offering me an opportunity to participate in it so now i'm not going to depend on just my salary alone because once satan can make a man handicap when he knows your source of income is one he closes that and that is the end of it but we have many of them you can always switch so for the sake of time let me stop at this point. god bless you thank you let our daddy talk to us i mean this is a very successful man just his salary alone as a professor is enough to bless him but then um please talk to us sir yeah. multiple streams of income <laughs> yes sir. So let me be very fast you see like if i'm going to start sir you see you see like when he was talking about excellence 
You see, if I will advise you in this generation, that you see, if your ability is just enough to read medicine, read a course simpler than medicine. I don't know whether you understand what I'm saying. Because you see, you are going to struggle a lot to excel in medicine. If your ability is just enough for you to read, except if God intervened. But if you go into a course lower, you become an authority. You see, the world today is not after the profession, but the people who are excelling in the, uh, in the profession. I read chemistry education. If you go to chemistry department, I have the opportunity of interacting with the best chemists who read uh, pure chemistry. And my colleagues in, fac uh, in faculty of science don't have. And the reason is because I excel in my, in my area. And I was able to get out and I was able to interact with people. You see, once you have opportunities like that, it, you do the same job, but you have multiple ways of getting money. Yes. I know an institution placed my name, and I was earning 59,000 naira anymore every month. I was not going anywhere because they needed the name of a professor to be in the list of their teachers. I've had instances that. where they just put his name just for endorsement. Money is coming. No prayer, no demons, <laughs> no courses. Money is just flying in and coming. You see, I've had an instance where I worked for a day and I was paid 400 and something thousand naira. I told my daughter there was a time they brought a piece of paper. I just read it in the office. It was just one thing I corrected, and they gave me 30 thousand naira. And that, that's what we call when you excel in your profession. But truly speaking, these opportunities are didn't come to me mm. until when I learned to surrender my resources to money pay to God. You see, I have money, but I'm willing and become poor today if the Lord needs it. Mm. I remember last time when I went in on sabbatical, I was coming up and there were praying financial prayers somewhere and I gave all the money I had and I was wondering what I was going to do. But do you know within two weeks God raised up two jobs that I got over a million naira. I think I'll stop that. Amen. Amen. Amazing. Well, yes, sir, um, when it comes to multiple streams of income, we have to look at it in three ways. Number one, God has given you a message, right? And that message is divine. It's from him. Your assignment, your life's pursuit, what he has wired you to achieve. But the method and the market can be manipulated. So, for example, apostle can preach a message. And that message can be given free, which is how most people get the messages. Yes or no? He can do it as a compendium, right? And just sign on it. And that can be a product that can be commoditized. Yes or no? He can sit down with the Bible and write his thoughts on the Bible. And it can be maybe the Koinonia Bible. Same message. Yes or no? The method has changed. He can now choose to write a book. Same message. The method has changed. He can now choose to host a seminar for top VIPs. Maybe full gospel media and maybe they travel to Dubai. And then they charge a fee. The method has changed. But the message remains what? The same. Sometimes you can create multiple streams of income by tweaking the method. So the same product, but you do it in different ways. Do you understand what I'm saying? The same product, you do it in different ways. You see some ties. They put tie and pocket square. You buy it as one. They do cufflinks alone. You can buy it as one. They can couple it. Do you understand? So the method can change. Then the market can change. If you want to create another stream of income. For example... If we're going to, there are some places where we cannot do this kind of thing without charging money. It will not work. So the market requires that you charge money. If you want to do it for CEOs, there's a level of hospitality they desire. You do it in Transcorp. The market has changed. Income can come from there. You now say, let's do a campus one. It will not be a ticketed event. A bank will sponsor it. Income comes from there, but the market has changed. Do you understand? So sometimes in creating multiple streams of income, you have to look at what it is you are currently doing. Is there a different method? Some people ignore social media. Do you know many of the things you do for free? You can charge on social media. You know why? The people you do it for free for, they know you. So they don't want to pay you. But if it's someone in Australia, he will pay you. Where do I know myself? My friend, this is my account. Why are it? I will teach you, right? So you have to think about it that way. And then you can now leverage social media around what you do and then charge. Same thing, online, offline. You can create multiple streams of income from there. Yeah. Amazing. Yes, sir. Hallelujah. Yeah, 
I want to respond um, to this in this way that I believe all of us, everyone must be involved in doing business. And this is uh, what gives me this inspiration. There is this proverb, uh, I don't know, maybe you are going to permit me to say it in Yoruba. Oh, why and, not? Go ahead. Okay, and probably I will also try to interpret it. It says that, Ishe Baba Sheje Owo Baba Shela. Now, what it means is that when you walk, it is the father of what you will eat or what you can eat. You get salary, you, your, your feeding is guaranteed. But when you do business, then your riches is guaranteed. Your wealth is guaranteed. So um, if, as, okay, I'm, a, I'm presently a lecturer, okay, ev eventually we'll get to become a professor and all of that. But, but I'm, not, I'm not seeing myself, you know, and uh, maybe eventually, okay, retired and maybe retired in my own house and all of that. But, but I'm not seeing just that. Uh, I, I'm seeing that until I do business, um, what is called uh, kingdom wealth, that is when it can materialize. If, if only it's just salary that I live on, then I would just be comfortable and that will just be all that it, that it is to it. But one must be involved in doing business. It is actually in doing business that these blessings, I believe, these blessings, this wealth can come on one. Uh, thank you very much. God bless you. Shall they say something? Multiple streams of income. Yes, Lord. Hallelujah. Okay. I would, I would want to say a little on what Pastor Alpha said earlier. Um, trying to throw la more light on the importance of multiple streams of income. My husband is a lecturer. I am one as well. J let's assume, um, especially for those of us that work now, since um, I think this year, with the funny things that has been happening in our country, how things have been financially, when salaries come and all of that, and so if everybody is tied down, you know, you begin to pray, give us this day our uh, transport fare. I know that's what um, uh, civil servants pray for sometimes around these times. But then the reason for multiple streams of income becomes very, very important at such times. Everybody is not just waiting for dates. In fact, civil servants popularly call um, 20, anything from 20, they call it 20, hungry months. I have said I would never call it with them. 20, any from 21, 22, of course, now your account is getting red because you're waiting for a lot. And these days, a lot doesn't come until first week, second week of the next month. Amen. That's alpha, right? Amen. So, for those kind of times, you definitely need something. No matter how small, you're living in a neighborhood, the houses are just coming up in that area. It could be bags of water. Sorry, I'm, I'm saying it. If, no matter how small, you need something. You need to buy, you have visitors, you have you have to get meat in your, at, at least ladies, you know how really bad and terrible we feel when someone comes to your house and you don't have anything to offer. You understand? At least there is something in the pot to serve along with your food. You don't, then at least there should, if there's no aquatic, there should be terrestrial. You know, something like that. So no matter how small it is, praise the Lord, there should be something that is coming in. And then we should have a plan. As we are getting our income, there should be something that is going towards that plan. You want to have a school, you want to have businesses, whatever it is, there should be a part. Pastor Jimmy was saying something about savings. There should be a part of your income that is going towards that plan for your multiple source of income. You don't just eat up everything. Apostle said you don't eat your seed. It's important that you should realize that what you have in your hand should produce a greater harvest for your future. Praise the Lord. Amen. Wow. Um, I promise you we have to stop here. We'll do the part two of this. Praise the Lord. Um, a mic was put there. The intention was to have us come and you know, give our questions and then even attempt some things. I really planned for it to be really interactive. Um, our time is fast spent. I'm not sure we may have that time again so i'll just strike a deal with us let's break this into part one and part two maybe not next week but i promise you i will dedicate a day maybe next month and finish up on this because we need to hear you talk this mic is not just for questions it's also to hear your perspectives the reason why we do this is because we want to challenge many of us and not just in the conventional way of having the pulpit you know and and speaking here and there uh, 
but let me use two minutes to just wrap up this thing about finance there's so much this is only the tip of the iceberg that they have to bring we've preached extensively on that the economic system of the kingdom financial dominion part one to four the wealthy place part one to four and um, so on and so forth but then let me say a few things and i'm going to challenge a lot of people with this you can never become a millionaire working for money the percentage of people who ever become true kingdom millionaires with peace of mind working for money um, working for money is the worst way to be rich is the very worst way it's only a good starting point but you cannot continue there there are three main ways uh, people really generate wealth number one 96 96 percent of the whole world they trade their time for money that's what people do um is good but if it remains like that is the worst way to live so you do eight to five eight to five the day you don't do it there's no money forever and you are depressed by the time you are 40 you're already using the money to maintain your health so you live longer you lose your place as a father you lose relationship with your children it's not wise okay so 96 percent. this is statistics now 96 percent of the whole world get wealth by exchanging time for money is the worst way to ever try to uh, be, be rich you can start from there but it should open you up to other things number two three percent of the world know how to make their money produce for them that's the second way they make wealth so the money they get from the jobs or whatever the favor the breakthrough land houses all of that they have already established streams that multiplied matthew 25 he gave unto one one talent two talents and they went and the other one brought a hundred percent yield another a hundred percent yield and he told them well done good and faithful servant right so three percent of the world's billionaires and the world's millionaires make their wealth by using what they have as a seed not a harvest and then it keeps producing for them and then one percent the third way which is the most efficient way to be wealthy only one percent of the world does that is generating multiple streams of income you create a system around your finances multiple streams of income just like they said a lot of things here there are people who have sold properties as a seed into my life i've not even seen those properties i've not gone there to go and look at it like this are we together now very very important I remember some years ago um, I bought one small land somewhere very small maybe everything plus paperwork will be 300,000 and I know as at the last time or so that property was priced somewhere it was about 3 million naira and it's still there are you seeing that my children will never beg for food and this has nothing to do with prayer the place is not even fenced just for being able to buy a little property just like that they gave koinonia you know a, a a a property in 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 lekki the god blessed us with a property in lekki and you know we left it there and i'm sure the value of that property is running into millions now i say ministry will never beg for bread because we are not just receiving favor there is a system are, are you getting what i'm saying now so i'm challenging you you have to generate multiple streams of income but you start from somewhere trying to do all four is the starting point for many of us may be to get a job that's the easiest one to get the ball rolling then you save 20 percent i teach in the school of ministry the 30 70 principle 10 percent goes to god 20 percent goes to your future 70 percent is what you consume now whatever lifestyle 70 percent of your current income cannot afford you are not yet ready for it you see so when you keep saving 20 percent of your income a time will come you have enough money to be able to now begin to invest and create other avenues and then these things are giving birth to children to children to children and um, so on and so forth like that so it's, it's really very important that's what jacob did he had a few sheep and then he did not eat them he allowed them and through reproduction a time came he had so much praise the lord so this is very very important i wish we had time but this is not a business class this is purely koinonia is our stimulating a desire in you we've not talked about leadership 
but i know our time just put it in your mind that we'll close a bit late today please don't be offended it will be more than uh worth it we have to round up by talking about our spiritual lives because that's what will push us into the impartation we cannot just close without talking about that so let me give five minutes uh, please quickly guys it was going to be five minutes pastor alpha who is a spiritual man who is a spiritual man let's just talk about our spiritual lives we're rounding up who is a spiritual man okay simply put god is a spirit he created us in his image there was a disruption to that image in the garden christ came to restore that image and the man who has accepted that work of restoration and has submitted himself to go through the transformation that makes him look exactly like Christ. I see that man as a spiritual. Wow. Amazing. Prof, sir, why do Christians backslide? Why do we have believers who today are up and tomorrow are down? There are people probably seated here whose prayer lives are dead, word life, dead. They love Jesus. But it looks like that flow, consistency, is what a lot of believers lack in their work. Would you help, sir, to address what would be the reason? Why is it that there's this ups and downs spiritually? Today I'm on fire, tomorrow I'm down. Yes, sir. The, seriously, I would like to say, see, for me, what I feel, if a person has not really had a genuine encounter with God, you see, that what they have discovered, if you've had a genuine encounter with God and you've enjoyed the presence of God, wherever you are, you always feel... You see something sending you back to the presence of uh, God. And you see, like most people who backslide are those who just serve God on the surface. They come to the church because they see others come to the church. But you see, anytime you see you have, you have the opportunity of having one-to-one -one encounter with God, there is nothing on earth. You see, I've said this, there are instances, you see, like opportunities have come to me like this and I discover I was dry and I... I know it will take me uh, out of God's uh, uh, presence. Mm. And you see, value. You see, when people value material things more than, more than God, you can easily. You see, I say that once you become a Christian, if you want to survive, the first thing you must know is that I'm willing to die every day for Jesus. Once you have made that commitment with, uh, with God, it becomes very, very difficult for something to separate you from God. The world will try to entice you. But once there's that commitment and there's that one-to-one -one relationship with God, it is difficult. That's why the Bible says it is difficult for whoever that have tested this goodness to go back to the world again. And so I will, my advice is don't serve God on the surface. Break the distance and get to the Lord. Okay. Once he holds you, you will never want to leave. Okay, God bless you. Thank you. Uh, Jimmy, please profile in one minute. What is a restoration plan for a believer who has derailed right now? And he's needing someone to talk to him. You want someone to speak to you. You've, probably you were once in Christ. You love God. But for some reason, you know you are struggling. Maybe the person is not even in the faith again. You've lost touch. You used to be so addicted to the word. Right now, everything has dried and you want to come back. Can you please guide them in two minutes from okay. step A to B? Well, the first is to let him understand that the mere fact that he has a desire to return is proof that the Holy Spirit is still at work in him, convicting him. So, he should start from the place of the faithfulness of God, not his own faithfulness. Wow. This is a relationship. Only one person drew back him. And the fact that he still desires is proof. Having said that, he should quickly identify the things that led him astray and begin to take definite practical steps to cut off those things. Having said that, he should now begin to pursue a person that he can be accountable to, a figure or a fellowship like a prayer brand and all of that or a pastor and together they can depending on how far he has gone for example if it was an act of willful consistent sin a particular sin they can address it pray for him to be delivered and then come up with a plan of study prayer and service and then follow him up on that plan he should plant himself in a community of believers that will hold him accountable and bring him back into the kingdom and then he should give himself time to begin to work on that plan 
preferably three months to six months of consistency before he can start feeling like okay let me evaluate if he does this i think that he will come back and then service he should quickly begin to now start serving because there's something about ministry that places a demand on you to replenish replenish yourself last question and this is for the couple sir just you and your wife together um how do you maintain your spiritual life being working class i know how busy you are i know how busy your wife are um, your wife is sorry and i mean she's she, you're traveling all the time she's around taking care of the children you know she's a financial secretary in koinonia there's so much she's doing and uh, how do you both maybe as individuals and as a couple maintain the spiritual fervor especially as it concerns word study prayer fellowship together um, can you just quickly help us on that as we round up i i i think you have mentioned uh, the other time you were talking and you, you were talking about um having an organogram okay i'm an economist so maybe i'll call it scale of preference and the first thing on the list is one's relationship with god and so i want to say that too that uh, the most important thing aside all the busyness you know you are running here and there and all that the first and foremost most important thing in a man's life is his relationship with god if that is in place all other things will fall in line um, other relationship with others uh, even one's work will prosper and all of that so the first and foremost is one's relationship with God. That should not suffer. That should be serviced. That should be well taken care of. And if that is done, all other things will fall in line. Thank you. Shade, do you agree with your husband or would you want to add something? Yes, sir. I perfectly agree with him. I would also want to add, especially okay, now for me, I first of all, the place of the family altar is very, very important. But then there needs to be a place for your individual spiritual lives. Like for me, I sleep with koinonia messages. I leave it on sometimes. And then I wake up at night because really waking up, I would rather praying or studying while the children are awake is really not easy. My Bible will get torn. My notebook will get torn. I will get a lot of marks on it and all of that because they will also want to be involved. So I wait till they are asleep if I can do any serious spiritual business. And then sometimes I'm in the kitchen. My messages are on. My messages are on. The songs are on. I'm washing. And just having that consciousness of God's presence, you may not have the time to sit down, to close your eyes to pray. Because there are sometimes you even want to pray and then you fall asleep because of fatigue and tiredness. But then that presence around you, somehow it just keeps you in touch. I think when we're having the prayer and fasting, Daddy said something about um, how that we should sleep with that consciousness of God's presence. Especially when you're trusting God for the spirit of revelation. I don't know if we remember that. You may not be awake, but then your spirit man is alert and awake because of the presence that is around you. Praise God. Amen. Dr. and Mrs. Ojele, thank you so much. Thank you. May God bless you. Ejimi, thank you so much. Professor Mary, thank you so much. Pastor Alpha, I appreciate Thank you. Please, let's honor them, celebrate them. Thank you so, 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 so much. Hallelujah.